work to deal with the with the sound, but I appreciate having uh, uh, sound for the house and hope that helps people here. Um, <clears throat> I'll review briefly the uh, minutes or the or the meeting logistics. Anyone who's joining us remotely, please change your name display to your full first and last name on your on the screen, so we'll know who's talking to us. Um, we have. Uh, set up the uh, the Zoom connection so that anyone who wishes to address the council, everyone who's participating is muted, and anyone who wants to address the council will have to uh, get permission to unmute themselves, and that will hopefully avoid the problems uh, we had last time. Uh, we ask you to keep any comments or questions you have to under three minutes, and germane to the topic at hand. Um, and we will start by uh, approving the agenda. Is there any member of the council who has any concerns about the agenda? Anything that we need to add, rearrange, or change? Okay, the agenda is approved. We now move to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any item that is any topic that's not on the agenda. And uh, as I noted earlier, we would ask you to keep your comments to two minutes and Councillor Bate will assist us in the, in three minutes, and Councillor Bate will assist us in the timekeeping. Is there anyone here in the room who'd like to address the council? Okay, I don't see anybody. Anybody participating remotely who's looking to address the council? I'm not seeing any electronic hands, and I'm not seeing anyone, anyone physically raising their hands. So, We can move to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Um, the chair would it, uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, next we have a series of uh, appointments to various commissions, starting with an uh, application for an appointment to the Planning Commission. And if anyone who is present remotely for any of the uh, appointments, uh, we'd like to give you a chance to address the council. Step right up. <laughs> Good evening, councillors. Uh, my name is Aaron Kosicki. I'm a current member of the Planning Commission. Uh, I apologize. I didn't get my application in for um, reappointment until this afternoon, so I'm not sure if you have that uh, application in front of you. Let me just say that I've been on the commission for five years. Uh, I've really enjoyed the experience and would like to continue uh, the Planning Commission has been involved, as you probably know, in a variety of uh, activities over the last few years, including uh, trying to get the city plan over the finish line. Uh, I would. Yeah, I. I'm sorry, interrupting you. No, no problem. Is it, I think, are we better now? Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, you know, we're involved in trying to get the city plan over the finish line. Uh, I'd like to be involved in that process uh, at the very least. And, and obviously, we have a number of uh, important zoning discussions going forward, particularly in the wake of the, uh, the latest flooding and also trying to tackle the city's uh, housing uh, issues and uh, I'd like to be reappointed and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. 
So Bill, I'm, I'm seeing, I'm not only seeing one vacancy. Um, well, Mr. Kosicki is seeking a re- He's vacant his, his, tomorrow. And, and his term runs out. Excellent. Hello. Hello. Um, so my name is Carlton Anderson. Um, I've lived in Washington County for 22 years. Um, moving back uh, after being a truck driver for seven years. Um, but I've worked in software, Northern Power Systems, Vermont State Employee Credit Union. I've been here. Um, and I didn't think that, I, I want a community, I wanted to come back. I have no wife, no kids, I've never been married. I'll be 50 next year. And I didn't want, uh, I, I want a community again after being on the road for 700,000 miles, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't realize that the flood would be the vessel uh, to that, uh, and I accept that. Um, and so I'd just like to put my uh, name in the, uh, in the pot, because uh, I think I have some innovative ideas, um, and I'd like to be a part of the zoning, and you know, I watch Claybrook get built, um, and Pizzagalli build it, and Act 250 become something. Uh, so I'm very interested in the process, uh, civilly. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, again, Carlton Anderson. Okay, thank you. Uh, be, does anyone have any questions? Okay, thanks for coming. Okay, thank you. Do we have a motion? So are you gonna say something? Okay. <laughs> So, Do we want to take all of these? Oh, Kirby Keaton. I'm, okay, Kirby Keaton, I'll recognize you. <laughs> and, okay. Thank uh, thanks so much. Uh, I just wanted to also mention, so we have three vacancies on Planning Commission. I'm, I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Planning Commission right now. Uh, we have three vacancies, and... I'm not sure if you have all the up-to-date up applications, but we do have Ariane Kissam seeking uh, reappointment, and she put in an application. Uh, so I just want to uh, vouch for her as, as a third person. We you know we have three open seats. Um, some of you may know John Adams, by the way. He's, he's not currently seeking reappointment. Um, so that does leave uh, one vacancy without, um, you know, a returning commissioner. One vacancy. If I add John Adams, is another. That's two, not three. What am I? They do show that three terms are ending ten thirteen twenty three. I don't know why there's only one vacancy back there. You can see that so Mr. Kissing, Mr. So Adams, four. Terms four. Terms four. Terms are Ms. Kissing's terms are expiring on okay. October of twenty three, and the others are. So it looks like maybe there's a vacancy also for the twenty four because there should be seven in all. Mike, do you, can you no, shed some light on this? I can see in that chart, and I, with the things I had meant to get back to Mary to, to clarify that her list was outdated. Um, I believe Brian, is Brian Mills on that yes. list? So yes. he's, he is on there. And Kirby and Gabe Lachines. And Gabe, so the other person is uh, Maria. Um, yeah, she's on she's here. Right here. And Marie is on there too. Yep. So. so there's seven, right? There's four for 24 and three for 23. Three for 23. And you said there's a vacancy? There's... Mr. Adams is apparently not. Yes. Right. Oh, okay. So he's the only one not on that list. Right. Mr. No. Anderson is okay. yeah. applying yeah. for that. No, seat. that was what I was going to say. There are only three. I wanted to be clear. There are only three vacancies. There are not four vacancies. There are only three vacancies. There's a line that says vacancy with no yeah, name in it. That's wrong. That's wrong. Thank yeah. you. There you go. Three vacant seats, and we have three applicants. Okay. Because I was confused. I it, no, it, it, the, the list wasn't clear. And it is confusing because technically those vacancies don't become vacancies until Friday, but. Uh, right. I think technically, if we were to look at the charter, it's at the end of the month of September. And we've tried to get rid of the date piece so that way it wouldn't happen. So technically, it was, I believe, the last day of September. I think we'd have to look at the charter because that was where we have it sat in. Is the charter says originally we had them all over the map, and a few years ago we went and set them all up so all the planning commission gets reappointed in September or October. Um, but it's not by day; it's the seat ends at 
I believe, September 30th. Okay. Because Brian. Go ahead. Brian is also on here for 11.16. He should not, even though he started 11, he should end at the right time. He should end at the right yep. time because we, we assigned them to seats that end at a certain time. Yep. In our it's charter. Not, it's wrong on the chart, so. Yep. I'll, so, I'll okay. work with Mary to get that corrected. So now we have three vacancies, the ones now held by Aaron Kosicki, John Adams, and Ariane Kassam. And uh, John Adams is not seeking to be appointed and so the three applicants we have are Aaron, Ariane, and Carlton. Correct. Okay. And, and I'll take, before you vote, a, a quick big thank you to John Adams. He is the probably the longest serving planning commissioner. Um, he's getting off now. He's, he has been on since, I want to say 2014 or 15. So he's been on for probably nine years now. Uh, and I wanted to thank him for a lot of years he did all, a lot of the heavy work when we did the zoning update and a lot of the work now with the, the city plan update so i do want to thank him for his service that was a lot a lot of hard work twice a month for that many number of years so yeah. okay thanks thank so now would somebody like to make a motion For all three. So yeah. individual motions or you, you can make a motion for all three if you okay. want. Okay. You I don't, wanna, I don't do you have want all their names down, okay. so Tim, well, go right ahead. Motion then to move. I'd like to move that we reappoint Aaron Kasicki and Ariane Kassam mm -hmm. um, to the Planning Commission and as a new commission member, Carlton Anderson. Second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, thank you all for uh, for volunteering to do this. Next up, an appointment to the Public Art Commission. And on this one, we only have one. Well, I'm not sure. Let's see. It, that's what it looks like. Um, so is Judith here? And Judith Ehrlich, are you on online? Okay, apparently not. Would someone like to move her appointment? We appoint Judith Ehrlich to the Public Arts Commission. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, appointment to the Conservation Commission. And we have Madeline Cotter uh, who has applied. And that looks like that's the only vacancy. Madeline Cotter. Oh, Madeline Cotter, you're here. Um, so just a second and we'll get you unmuted. And now, you, and now I think you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, how's it going? Um, yeah, I uh, have been in Vermont for about 12 years now and uh, moved to Montpelier last year and um, went to school for environmental studies and I'm really interested in uh, kind of giving back to the community and I thought a good way to get involved would be to join a city commission. So threw my name in and uh, we'll see where you guys take it. But uh, looking forward to the opportunity. Thank you. Great, thank you. I will move to accept Madeline Connor's application. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, congratulations and thank you, Madeline. Thank you. And next up we have design review. And I was a little confused this is the design review 
committee, not the development review board, right? Correct. Okay. And we have Ben Cheney and Ben, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Great. Thanks for coming. Want to just introduce yourself? Sure. I've been uh, a Montpelier resident most of my life. Uh, I've been on design review board, I don't know how long, for maybe 10 years, maybe not that many. I don't know. Um, something I enjoy doing. It's, a, it's a, a way that I can contribute to my community that I care about. I've, I'm in the world of design and construction and understand the um, complexities between trying to do something well and do something affordably and uh, matters to me what how things get built in Montpelier. Great, thank you. Anyone have any questions for Ben before we move to a vote? Is there a motion to appoint Is, Ben? Uh, Go ahead. Ben, are you a uh, applying for a um, reappointment to a three-year term? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I move to reappoint Ben Cheney to a three-year term. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, congratulations and thank you, Ben. And last but not least, I think last. Uh, I didn't. I didn't hear any of that, but maybe I don't need to. You're in. You're you're reappointed. Thanks for doing this. He signed you up for life. <laughs> oh, some folks. Apparently, we've got audio problem. I didn't. I didn't. Okay, hear. you can hear us now, right? Yes. Great. Thank you. So Ben, you're you're appointed. Thanks for doing this. Great. Thank and, you all. And last up, we have an application of Tim Favorite to be uh, reappointed to the Energy Advisory Commission. And Tim, are you here? Looks like not. And do we have a motion? Uh, I'll move to uh, reappoint Tim Favorite to the Energy Committee. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? OK, thank you, Tim, for continuing to serve in this. I really appreciate everyone who stepped forward to devote your time, your energy, and your thoughts to to these uh, commissions. I have a question about the chart we received. It lists Dan Jones as expiring in 2022, but it lists him like he's still on. Hmm. Do you follow up on that? Thank you. Well, good question. Well, Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're to item number 11, uh, the Small Business Administration presentation. And let's see. Monica Miles was on. Yeah, there she is. Oh, great. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Monica Miles. I'm a uh, public affairs uh, specialist with the U.S. Small Business Administration. And um, the uh, SBA just wants to make sure that um, the uh, homeowners, renters, businesses, and nonprofit um, organizations in Montpelier are aware that uh, they can apply for a low interest rate disaster loan with the U.S. Small Business Administration um, if their home or their business or their nonprofit um, organization was um, adversely affected by the floods that occurred back in the month of July of this year. Uh, initially, the um, 
or at least or most recently rather the the deadline to apply was actually tomorrow um, but that has been extended until October 31st and that's with respect to uh, property damage uh, loans um, a um, homeowner or person who's renting their home um, in Washington County and the other counties that were declared a disaster um, as a result of the uh, floods and storms in July uh, can apply for a uh, property loan um, with respect to a homeowner. If the physical, uh, if the real estate was actually damaged, they can apply for a loan up to um, $200,000 with respect to a homeowner and a um, person who's renting their home, uh, they can apply for a loan up to $40,000. Uh, the interest rate for a homeowner or a renter is, uh, two, is it as low as 2.5%. The loan terms are usually 30 years. And in addition, with respect to all applicants, homeowners, renters, businesses, and nonprofit, uh, organizations, there's no payment um, due for the first year of the loan, and there's no interest that accrues for a full year of the year of the loan. Um, and the, if there was anyone who was um, able to pay the loan off at the uh, just prior to the end of uh, one year of having received the funds, they would be able to have use of the funds without um, incurring any interest whatsoever. With respect to a business, um, the end with respect to a nonprofit organization, the maximum loan amount is for is two million dollars, and that's for all of the um, loans that they could potentially take out. Um, a home, a, a business, or a nonprofit can um, uh, seek a loan for their real estate that was damaged, as well as the business personal property, such as the equipment, the supplies vehicles, things of that nature. Um, in addition, a homeowner in a business can apply for a mitigation loan. Uh, with respect to the homeowner, uh, they could apply for um, a mitigation project such as installing a sump pump, a French drain, retaining walls, um, whatever they feel that their home may um, benefit from in the event of another disaster in the future. Um, they could apply for that, and that would be in addition um, to any other loan that they received, and it could be up to 20% of the verified um, property damage losses. Uh, for the uh, business business that would want to apply for a mitigation loan, it would all be incorporated in the maximum amount of $2 million. For business, um, the loan is as low as 4%. And for a nonprofit organization, the loan amount is as low as 2.375%. The deadline for a business or a nonprofit applying for a loan, which is called an economic injury disaster loan, does not expire until April 15th, 2024. Uh, the economic injury loan is when a business or a nonprofit believes that as a result of the disaster, uh, the business revenue has decreased, and it's decreased to the point where they cannot uh, meet all of their necessary obligations, such as rent payments and and uh, paying their staff, thing, things of that nature, um, and that they need a loan in order to be able to remain in, um, uh, compliant um, with their obligations and to remain in uh, business. Uh, because that type of uh, damage sometimes does not um, manifest itself for a period of some months. Uh, the law does have a longer period for application, and that's, again, uh, doesn't expire until April 15th, 2024. So the uh, if anybody wants to apply for a loan, um, they can uh, go to um, one of the centers um, that are currently opening, are still open. Um, some of them are closing um, very soon. In uh, Washington County, um, there is uh, Waterbury Armory, um, which currently on the schedule that I have is scheduled to close on October 14th. 
And then elsewhere in the state, um, there's one a little further away, um, Ludlow Community Center, that's located in Windsor County. Um, that one at this point is um, not scheduled to close until October 21st. In addition, applicants can apply online for a loan at sba.gov forward slash disaster. They can also call the SBA for assistance and they can also call the SBA to get an updated list um, in terms of uh, where they might be able to apply. And that is 1-800-659-2955. And if the person is hearing impaired, they can call 711 for assistance. Um, and once a person applies for a loan, um, the agency may ask um, for them to submit some additional documentation. They should always be very careful to go ahead and do that and to hopefully do that in the time period that the agency requests. Um, the SBA uh, um, typically is uh, able to give a person their decision with respect to the loan determination within two to three weeks of all of their documentation and paperwork being submitted. And then once the person has the opportunity to review uh, the loan documents and uh, to, if they decide to go forward with the loan, um, usually the agency releases the first set of funds within five business days. Want to say um, also that if a, um, an app, a potential applicant is waiting to hear from their insurance company before they decide whether or not to apply for the loan, they don't have to do that. There's no application fee. Um, if they get approved for a loan and they decide later on that they do not want to accept the loan, they do not have to um, accept the loan. Um, uh, so there's no kind of requirement that if somebody applies, they have to go forward within it uh, with the loan. They're not entering into a contract with the SBA at that point at all. So they don't have to, to do that. And that's um, pretty much it. The program um, is set up to try to, um, of course, help people who um, need additional funds beyond their insurance and beyond whatever FEMA uh, may uh, be able to provide them with. And, um, and to, of course, try to keep businesses um, in business. Um, FEMA has um, uh, indicated that um, in a study, it, uh, it was determined that about 40% of businesses that have been affected by a disaster do not reopen after the disaster. And the SBA is trying to um, avoid that from happening. Thanks very much for this. Um... Are, have a lot of people in uh, in Montpelier, the Montpelier area, already uh, applied? Um, yes, Montpelier is um, one of the counties uh, with um, the more applicants, and um, in the whole statewide, as a result of the July floods, twenty three million dollars um, in um, disaster loans have been approved by the SBA so far. Thanks. Anyone have any other questions? Terry. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, I, I just wanted to share a little bit about my personal experience and my family's experience, and maybe you can answer a couple questions or maybe I can just let other people know what, kind of what it's been like. So um, our house was affected by the floods and we put in a FEMA application and we were told that we needed to apply for an SBA loan. So we did that and we were told we were approved for an SBA loan. Um, this was weeks and this was months ago. Um, but we were waiting to hear from our insurance company. So we were fortunate in that we had flood insurance, but it took uh, two months to get information from our flood insurance company. And when SBA found out how much we were getting from insurance, the loan amount changed. And um, and we are now in the process of trying to readjust things because insurance is not enough to cover our expenses. So now we're trying to adjust things with the SBA. And just the other day I was on the phone with you all and was told it was gonna to be six to eight weeks to process um, our adjusted application. So, um, and I'm also, it's news to me that there's money for mitigation. And I think that would be um, of great interest to people in Montpelier because mm -hmm. 
like many people in Montpelier, we are faced with having to replace our furnace and our hot water heater and our electrical panel, but we're not able to replace them where they were in the basement. We have to move them upstairs and to above the flood level, which is, which our insurance company doesn't consider covered. Our insurance company calls that mitigation. And so, um, so that's helpful to know. So I, I just want to flag that for other people in Montpelier who may be facing that and are, and are not able to cover that. FEMA also doesn't cover, from what I've heard, we're not getting any FEMA money, so I'm not really sure about that. Um, I'm interested in the interplay between FEMA and SBA, because that's been kind of confusing to me in this whole process. Um, but I, and I'm also wondering about the, the interest rates that you talked about, that interest rates for homeowners are two and a half percent, which is not the interest rate that we have been offered in, in, with my family. Um, so I'm wondering about that. I'm also wondering if you know about, I'm sorry, I'm throwing a lot of questions at you <laughs> all at once, but I'm wondering no about the, the, Barry, the Barry Disaster Recovery Center. Um, I'm wondering if you know when that is scheduled to close or if that has already closed. And I don't know um, about that. The paperwork I have, that closed as of today. Oh, okay. But I don't know since the deadline has been extended. I don't know if FEMA is going to be, you know, extending any of these centers or reopening anything. But um, on the paperwork I have, it's, it was closed as a um, as a close of business today. Thank you. Okay. Did I cut you off? I'm sorry. Nope, that was that was everything that I had. Okay, well, one thing um, usually I do say uh, this when I'm um, giving this presentation, but um, with respect to the interest rate, sometimes, and I don't know what your situation is, but sometimes when a person has um, excellent credit and can get um, loans in the open market, the in interest rate can go up as much as double. Um, so, you um, credit, your interest rate is higher. Right, because you know the law was um, <laughs> yeah the law was to help people who cannot you know primarily who cannot get loans on the open market so that um, the small business administration was kind of like the the last resort for them because otherwise they would not be able to get a loan anywhere else so for for um, homeowners renters businesses and nonprofits who you know are in a better situation um, dependent, you know, a big, uh, dependent upon the type of loan, um, it can be double. Now for the uh, economic injury disaster loan for the businesses and the nonprofits, uh, it's at that lower, their lower rate. Okay. And you had, did you have another, you had another question that you raised, right, Carrie? Well, I, I don't know if you can speak to this, but the, the, yeah, the interaction between FEMA and the SBA was quite confusing for me as someone, especially in those early days when we're not sure what we're going to get from our insurance company. And it took months to resolve things with our insurance company. And, I, but you may, I, I don't know if you can speak to that. Well, um, I know that um, SBA always tells people to apply um, for, with FEMA first. And then FEMA often tells people to go to SBA as well. Now, a lot of people, um, you know, may um, be declined by um, FEMA, um, you know, for various reasons. Um, it might be the type of damage they have, it, you know, or, or something of that nature. And then the person definitely needs to go to um, SBA and then apply if FEMA tells them to do so. Now, sometimes when people come into SBA, they don't, qualify for a loan for whatever reason. Um, there might be some ways for them to correct that situation so they they ultimately do qualify for the loan. But in any event, when the person doesn't or the applicant doesn't qualify for the loan with the SBA, then the SBA usually sends them back to FEMA. And then sometimes that same person will end up being able to get some type of rel relief from FEMA. So I don't know if, um, and then the computer systems are some kind of way, I don't know how, um, uh, in, in some type of, at some point, there's some kind of way that each computer system can verify that somebody has been referred to SBA, and then um, also whether or not they were approved for the loan with, with SBA. 
uh, so that FEMA can make a decision as to whether or not they qualify for anything else or if they can, you know, give them some aid or refer them to any particular resource. Thanks. So I'm not sure if there was anything more that, that you experienced with that or not. No, that's all. Thank you very much. I appreciate oh, okay. you taking okay. the time to talk okay. about this. Well, but those were but those were all good um, key um, yeah. issues that people will sometimes bring up about that whole process. Well, it does seem like a long wait for for some of this for action on some of this, doesn't that's it? Snow in the back. And here we are. Right. It's we're in the middle of October. It does feel like a long time to me. I'll, I'll double check into <laughs> check into that and. Um, you know, get back in touch with you. Because someone who needs a furnace, they don't want need to be waiting another six weeks from mm -hmm. mid October. Thank right. you. Any other questions? Uh, okay. Well, well. Thanks very much for coming, and uh, I'm sure you deal with uh, with people all the time who are extremely frustrated and uh, <laughs> is I think it's the nature of the uh, the situations that you're you're dealing with right it's it's fine we we understand that people are under a lot of you know stress and it's no problem whatsoever okay well thanks a lot okay. all right thank you all take care you too bye now bye. thanks bye all right Next up, we have item 12, Housing Committee Membership Compos Composition Policy. Carrie, I'm sorry to hear that you're dealing with all of that. <laughs> It'll be okay. It's just very, very slow. <laughs> um, and don't mind me reading from this, then I don't stumble across my words as much. My name is Jessica Oprowski. As a member of the City Housing Committee and a renter in the city for seven years, I'm here to share two motions that came before the Housing Committee on January 3rd of this year and were voted on and approved. These are, one, that a minimum of two renters should be members of the Housing Committee at all times. <coughs> two, that in reviewing applications for membership, the City Council should aspire to create a balance of renters versus homeowners that reflects the city's current makeup. Most recently, we understand that approximately 40% of the city rents, therefore 40% of the committee should be ideally made up of renters. I'm here on behalf of the Housing Committee to formally ask the City Council to adopt these measures as part of the official Housing Committee selection criteria. The first being a minimum requirement going forward, the second being a goal. This is especially important to consider how now because we have an open seat and currently only one renter on our committee, which is me. Additionally, members of the committee have expressed interest in reviewing future applications for memberships and making recommendations to the city, councils, city council. Renters are a huge part of our community. We work here, shop here, eat here, and a lot of us send our kids to school here. We're key members of the community. Even if we are not homeowners, we contribute in many ways to keep the community alive. This is why I ask you to show renters that we do matter and that you see us, you all see us as important community members, as well as keeping space in the housing committee to always have at least two of our nine seats filled by renters. This will keep, this will help represent the voices of many renters in the community, so we can all work together and try to better the current housing crisis. Thank you. Thanks. Don't go away. There okay. may be questions. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Good to see you after not being on the committee for a while. Yes. <laughs> Donna. Are there any suggestions if indeed we make this change and we get no renters or to, to fill them or not enough renters? I mean, to me, a renter and homeowner, I'm sort of colorblind. It's like, it doesn't matter, right? They apply. Right. But if we're not getting applications, is there a fallback? <laughs> um, or a way to reach renters specifically. I well, know. I think that ideally that's what I would love to see is that a way that we can encourage renters to put in applications. I think that a lot of renters probably assume that maybe our voice isn't heard as much or it doesn't matter as much. So if there's a way that we can, as a city, kind of encourage renters to apply. Um, but I guess that if we don't get renters that apply even after trying to push for that, then 
we'll just have to fill the seat with somebody that wants to apply. <laughs> Can we word it that way? Or, or there could be a vacancy, a vacant tenant slot. Say, say you're one, your tenant, one tenant who's on the uh, committee. Uh, but if a if a slot opens up that could only be filled by another tenant, then it could be that that slot just remains open until we have until we get a tenant to uh, to apply. Well, I look to Josh, but. Um... <laughs> Um, I, I'm assuming that maybe as a committee we would probably have to talk about that to see if we feel comfortable with like one seat being open. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think um, going back to what Jessica said, I think doing a better job of trying to reach renters to fill the vacancy, I think is the, is the priority. Um, and I, I don't know, I, but I think leaving a seat vacant for a renter um, can happen. There is nine on the committee, so having eight on the committee doesn't affect the quorum as much um, as maybe a board that has five. So um, my opinion would be that would be okay. Um, I think it's I think it is important, and, and the housing committee did indicate a real strong desire to have a composition that that best matches what our community um, is. So I support having at least two renters on the committee. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, um, as as of one of the council members who's part of this committee, I'm very much in support of this. Um, I think uh, you know the the proportion of 40 to 60 renters to homeowners is really really striking and really tells us that this is a city that where it's not just a, a minority, it's not just a small number of people who are renting. This is a really significant number of people. It's probably gonna go up, um, I, or I wouldn't be surprised if it goes up in the future. And two out of seven, two is kind of the Two isn't even really enough, actually, for sort of a critical mass. Like if you're if you're a, an underrepresented group, you need three. It is kind of the general rule of thumb, right? To feel like you're not like you feel like you're the only one right now. And if there's one more, then it's like, well, there's two of you. That's better than just one. But three really makes you feel like, OK, we're here. And three still doesn't get us to 40 percent. So um, so I think two is a bare minimum. I think that's good. And with a goal of 40 percent. And if we have an opening, we have an opening, we have a vacancy. I mean, committees have vacancies all the time. And if we say that we have a requirement of at least two renters, then that is part of what goes out as we're trying to recruit members. And so I think it will be helpful. And I think a lot of renters will probably be encouraged to hear that and hopefully be encouraged to apply. You could still have more because there's nothing in the other right. slots to say you can't be. I mean, I never thought of it as, as a division, but. So, mm -hmm. okay, good. Yeah. yeah. But in theory, if things get good and you have more renters than property owners, I suppose in the future you could also look at rebalancing based on the aspirational goal. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. It's not... Yeah. But do we have any other yeah. committees where there's like a specified? Yeah. I don't know if it's divided. I don't know why we would have it divided by renters or homeowners, but we certainly have plenty of committees where we say, you know, we'd like one person representing, you know, the business community, one person representing this, and you know, it's it's usually more an ad hoc committees and standing committees. But there's often times when we've said we'd like a seat, or even informally when choosing people, saying, "Well, we'd let, you know, we want to make sure this voice is heard." And so it's not unheard of. And I think, you know, again, it's a policy question. There's no legal reason why you couldn't do it. It's it's really up to the council to say this is how we want our committee composed. And, you know, I mean, you could similarly, you could say, I'm not recommending this, but you know, by the same idea, you could say we also want at least one landlord, you know, one person who rents. So, you know, I mean, so so you can choose how you want these committees. They're 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 here to advise the council about housing policy. So the makeup is who you choose, who and how you choose to do it. Yeah, so. Um, I also like this idea. Um, as a practical matter, how would you make the transition? If you have nine members, is it a full committee now? No, no. we have one seat. That's you open. have one seat, so you could you could put that up for a renter, and then as the next person um, term expires, you would you would go to the proportionality in three three and six renters owners. Is that? 
think that oh, you think it would have worked? Yeah. yeah. The, way, the way it's written, and I think it's been it's well done, I think is you'll always have two. So if right now there's one, you have a vacancy, so we would make an, you know, it would, you either appoint a renter or you don't appoint anybody. In the future, say you had two, it's saying that the council should consider with a goal of trying to get to 40% and then see who applies and, you know, mm -hmm. see you have a couple of good candidates, you know, tie goes to the renter until you get 40% and then you, you decide who has, you know, but I think that would be, it, it wasn't a hard, you know, quota. It's a, this is the goal you're trying to get to. But obviously the point Council Member Brown makes is well taken that the, you want a critical mass of that voice. Personally, I think this is a great idea. I think, you know, one of the things that we have been striving for in the last several years is to open up city government and all of our uh, commissions and committees to, uh, to more, more diversity and this proposal has a tendency of maybe getting more younger people involved, more people who might not have been living in, in the town for, for as long as people who were homeowners. So I, I think it's great. Donna. So for now, the recommendation is two and that we could word our ad when we get another opening to encourage both homeowners and tenants so people put the words out there that people can see it that okay i'd make a motion to support that is there a seconder i'll second any further discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. anyone opposed okay thanks thank you thanks, thanks for, for serving you. and being thank here you. <clears throat> Next up, we have item 13, no the uh, public hearing on the uh, proposed uh, zoning, uh, in zoning ordinance, and I will start by opening the public hearing. Mike, you're up. All right. Uh, so I am Mike Miller. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development for the city, and uh, I presented to you at the last meeting. Uh, a quick amendment uh, to kind of reflect some of the changes to allow Country Club Road to be developed as emergency housing. Uh, and the proposal hasn't changed with one exception. I had uh, somebody who reviewed it and noticed that one of my references was incorrect on 3125 point B, which says, uh, the provisions of this subsection apply to development of emergency housing as defined in section 5201, and it should say 5101. So, um, other than that, this is the same presentation you received two weeks ago. Um, no other changes have been made. The quick summary for anyone who is not at that hearing was that we already had in our zoning a use called temporary housing, and it covered both emergency housing and emergency shelters. And there's a, a very significant difference between the two, one being that um, emergency housing is permanent housing. You're there for more than 30 days and you have tenancy. You have certain rights that come with that. Uh, whereas an emergency shelter is some place where you stay less than 30 days and you don't end up with tenancy and, a, and having those rights that go along with it. So usually emergency shelters fall into the same category as hotels and motels and those types of things because those are also transient, what we call transient housing. You're not a permanent resident um, as opposed to emergency housing, which is generally falls under per permanent housing. So um, we split that into two groups and we made some special provisions. We created a new section 3125, uh, which describes the emergency housing provisions. And so I guess at this point, I will leave it open for questions or any comments from, from folks. Okay, thanks. Any comments from or questions from members of the council? And are there any public. comments for members of the public? Joe Castellano, I see you were you're were here tonight, and last time I <laughs> cut you off because we were past that uh, agenda item. Do you want to be heard now? Actually, no, I'm okay. Okay. Any other members of the public? I'm not seeing any hands come up. Okay. 
I think we can close the public hearing. I guess, Mr. Mayor, I'll make one more um, quick clarification, just so everyone is clear. These, this is an emergency um, amendment. It's an emergency hearing, so it's, it falls under interim bylaws. Uh, and therefore, these bylaws will only be in effect for a period of two years. Uh, we will include this in a zoning update that's coming up. That'll make it permanent. But at this point in time, this is an interim change that will be effective for only two years. But um, we expect that this will also come back to you probably in January to be formally adopted as a permanent change to the zoning. But I wanted to make sure it was clear to everyone this is an interim change um, that will result from this process tonight. Yeah, because there's probably some other uh updates you're going to want to do in January, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now this is one of two, uh, one public hearing number one. Are we planning on only doing one because this is an emergency? Because this is an interim change, it only requires one. Okay. Okay. Any comments or questions from members of the council? Is there a motion? <laughs> I'll make a motion that, that we adopt the interim emergency housing and shelter language. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <laughs> All right. We have passed the interim uh, zoning provision. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Next up, we have Confluence Park. And this is, this is a relook of a uh, discussion we had at our last meeting. Thank Hi, you, folks. everyone. Thanks oh. for coming. Thank you for having us here today. Um, my name is Kasha Ranjo. I am one of the co directors of Vermont River Conservancy. <laughs> and I'm Roy Schiff, a uh, Montpelier resident and a water resource engineer with the company called SLR. Our hope for today is to review some of the project history for Confluence River Park, share some of the latest designs, share budgeting and fund fundraising efforts. And our hope is to reaffirm your support to move forward with the project. This project has been in every master plan, every downtown plan, every river management plan for about 30 years now. It is now ex pretty exciting to see it on the brink of moving forward from plans to giving Montpelier a vibrant downtown riverfront and the heart of downtown, a huge asset to re it residents an opportunity to draw visitors into our communities and the key part of a renewed, vibrant, thriving downtown core. This builds on what other communities have achieved all over the country, right here, not too far from us in Franklin, New Hampshire. Um, it was one of, it's one of the lowest income communities in New Hampshire and a dying post-industrial downtown. They had the vision to convert this area that was filled with homeless encampments and a derelict part of town into a riverfront access for the community. It's now an economic driver directly leading to new businesses, jobs, and attracting for people to live and business, live and visit the community. Marty, who has been involved with the project, is on the Zoom call tonight and available to answer questions and share his experience if you're interested. Also, not too far from us, the Burlington Waterfront which generates tens of thousands of dollars every day for their downtown businesses because the river access is downtown and the heart of the community. It's the same in Denver, Missoula, Montana, Reno, Nevada. These are communities that have already taken the leap and um, decided that their investment now <laughs> seems like a bargain, what they put in years ago, because the businesses and the residents cannot imagine their community without these places. 
and cannot imagine the places they live without downtown at Rivers for an access. And this is the opportunity that we have now in Montpelier. So what's this look like in Montpelier and how did we get here? <laughs> like I said earlier, it's been in community plans for 30 years. The latest iteration of this park was born alongside one Taylor Street, which was addressing housing and transportation. And the idea was to address housing and transportation and parks in the same space in the same time. That's an equity element that allies with the Montpelier Parks Commission's, Commission's vision that everyone in this community live within a 10 minute walk of open space, especially our lowest in income residents like at One Taylor and French Block. It also um, rose up with conversations around dam removal, which is now in early stages of feet of visibility studies to look into the removal of four dams in and upstream of Montpelier. Two of those dams are right at Confluence Park. This would reduce flood risk and, and downtown Montpelier, reconnect the river, and also connect the community with its river and create the opportunity to float from Bar Hill all the way into downtown, connecting our businesses by the river. Our organization at Vermont Con River Conservancy, we got involved years ago. We spent two years talking with the community, not about any particular project. We said, what do you want to see here in town? What do you want to see? What does Montpelier need? And the community, throughout dozens and dozens of conversations, the project that rose to the top as a top community priority was Confluence Park. That's why Vermont River Conservancy got involved in this decades long vision was because this community and these residents asked us to be part of this and make the 30 year vision a reality. And now we have the chance to follow through. We had as an organization, dozens and dozens of meetings with residents city council, city staff, community leaders. And what we heard is that people want access to the river for all, that, including ADA access, proximity to the low income housing, space for outdoor events, performance and art, a spot to simply <laughs> eat lunch by the river, meet with colleagues, fish, paddle, tube, and a space that's flood resilient infrastructure that can bounce back after the floods like we just had. To orient you to the space, go to the next one. Um, I will turn things over to Roy to orient you to the space and share the designs. Okay, thanks Kasha. Um, so I just wanna get oriented. Here's the, um, if you can see the screen, the bike path. Um, here's the edge of the one Taylor building. And Montpelier, um, the, the area set aside for the park is roughly a quarter acre um, that sits between the trestle bridge the bike path um, and, the, and the confluence of the rivers. And here's the concept design um, that emerged from all those public meetings and the vision. Um, and it consists primarily of an ADA accessible pathway from the bike path to the river, um, meeting um, certain grades. And the idea is to be able to access um, with a whole range of mobility, um, a fishing platform, a paddling access um, for uh, smaller boats, as well as a, a larger area um, downriver on the main stem Winooski, a paddling area where many boats could be stockpiled for events and trips and whatnot. Um, also on the upper flat area um, towards one tailor, um, there's actually an open space um, with seating and shelter. And we've talked with parks, um, there's actually a, a um, pavilion or gazebo for some education and programming that was desired. So those are kind of the main the main elements. And then, and then primarily there are, you can see there are access points all along the face of the park into the river, both the north branch as well as the main stem. And there's seating opportunities that are shown in orange. That was something that the community resoundingly wanted was a place to sit by the river to go grab lunch, come down to the river and enjoy this amazing setting. And it's quite amazing when you get down in there, it's really, a, it feels like a pretty wild setting in the heart of our downtown. So again, bringing people to the river is really the heart of this. Um, here's a three-dimensional model that reflects the current design. 
Um, this is a, an overview, um, sort of hovering over the point of the confluence, looking back over the land. What you see is a bunch of wall structures that allow this small parcel to become ADA accessible. Um, it's flood resilient design, and there are pockets of plantings around to sort of mimic the riparian areas. Um, there are spaces to dock boats. On the north branch is an ADA accessible boat launch. So um, we worked with Vermont Adaptive on what that means to be an inclusive waterfront. Um, there are many um, outfits in our area offering paddlers um, paddle trips for a whole variety of um, mobility, um, uh, um, mobility conditions. A lot of riverfront access. You can see a fishing platform overhanging the water. There's actually a deep cut right in here where we know the fishing's good, so that accesses that area. And then you can see in the background the bike path winds through the area, and then there's seating at the top. And I'm just going to flip through a couple of these. Here's a, a view from actually hovering out at the water um, down at the river view looking. Um, you can see um, the, we, we designed prior to the July flooding the area to be a little harder, um, knowing that this area receives ice loading um, and fluctuating flows from the releases that happen at Wrightsville. Um, and then we, you know, we obviously saw uh, amazing flooding um, uh, you know, this year in July. Here's a view at the fishing level. So um, a person, walker, able-bodied, wheelchair could wheel down and come to this fishing area. We actually built one of these on the New Haven River in the town of Bristol. Um, it was pretty wildly popular. We're really excited to possibly bring that to Montpelier. Um, here's a, a larger landing area. This originally was designed to be a major boat depot for trips leaving the area and moving, going downstream either to the high school or further downstream on longer trips. And we actually incorporated a bunch of seating because, again, a lot of people, um, we tried to create different areas for people to sit down, have privacy, but also enjoy the river environment. And then here's a view of some of that seating, some of these niches that are um, up, up at, towards the top of the park, the bike paths off to the right in this photo. So a couple images to try to bring this to life. And here's the upper park um, looking over the bike path at, at some of the proposed seating. Um, there was also a desire to incorporate arts and event space. We don't have time um, to share all that detailed information. We're happy to um, supply any more information if you are interested and wanted to share this model. Um, so here's the project budget. Um, read a lot of information in the bridge and others about how this started as a $600,000 project and landed as a $2.9 million project. Love to set the record straight on that. This is a really different project. Through that visioning process, Things like um, accessibility and the fishing platform and the boat launch really were, were added, as well as changing in some of the spaces. In addition, we learned that there's contamination under the edge of the site, so that really um, increased the, the cost of the project. So um, you can see here the major piece of the project, this green slice of the pie, is the structural elements of the walls, um, both for flood resilience as well as to retain the slopes and, and create that AD accessibility. And then the grading price went up a lot because that includes um, exporting of all the material under the site has to, because of the, the um, quality of that soil, has to go to Coventry and landfill, and that's expensive endeavor to do that. But it's exciting to clean up that infer that fill contaminated fill from under the site. Um, there's also a contingency and just things that are normally in in the budgeting for for a project. So I wanted to share that with you. And now I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kasha to talk about the fundraising and how we're working towards that goal. So then the question is, how do we raise $2.9 million to build the project? And right now, as we speak today, 35% of the funds have been raised to move the project from 30-year design and vision towards implementation. So this includes funding from the Clean Water Fund, Downtown Transportation Fund, Vermont Arts Council, Land and Water Conservation Fund, and of course the city bond. A portion of this is also the Land and Water Conservation Fund. The Land and Water Conservation Fund was established in the 1970s. And this is revenue that it, the federal government receives from offshore oil and gas development. That revenue is congressionally designated to be used for parks and open space and this type of infrastructure. Now, when it was created in the 70s, from then until 2018, Congress failed to actually designate all the money that it was supposed to get to the parks and open space. 
and 2018, Congress authorized permanent full author funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So there is now more funding available than any ever before. And currently, we have a commitment of $330,000 through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. They require a one-to-one -one match. Based on the current budget, it seems very achievable to go back to the Land and Water Conservation Fund that now has significantly more funds and say, hey, this is a different project, a larger project than we imagined when we first went to you and receive that, that second chunk of 40% more funding from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. That leaves just 25% left to raise. So with that 25%, which is about $800,000, what might that look like? So the opportunities that I've been looking into um, are brownfields funding from the state. That requires just a 10% match, unlike the federal funds, which is very achievable. Um, and they specifically prioritize investing brownfields redevelopment funds into sites with very high economic value because they want to see an economic return. Those funds are through the, um, the Agency of Commerce. And I was on the phone with um, one, Christy Farnham, who works for, for the agency, and she said to me she, today, she said, with outdoor recreation impacts across the state on an incredible traje trajectory demonstrating return on investment, it won't be hard to make a case for Brownfields funding for this project. And so she's there in the economic space, the business space. Her job is to look out for businesses, and she sees the value of this park supporting our businesses and building our local economy, and that's the only reason they would put money into this, and she sees that opportunity. Another opportunity is the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, I'm actually submitting a grant tomorrow to request $200,000. Um, we have, I talked to them on the phone, we have the designs, these are implementation funds. We are ready to implement and uh, we're at the right stage for those types of funding and they're looking for accessible recreation opportunities that connect people with our rivers, which this is. There's also the Vermont Outdoor Recreation and Economic Collaborative as a possibility. Um, there's a state recreational tr facilities grant opportunity um, through the Buildings and General Services and um, VTrans has grant programs for alternative transportation because this is a node on the back bike path. It has um, transportation amenities, lighting, things like that. There are aspects of the budget. Now that we have a specific budget, we could go to, to that grant program and ask for funding. And so there are a lot of fundraising opportunities ahead. I know you all, when you met a couple weeks ago, were asking, where is this project financially right now? So this is a little bit detailed. It was in the council packet that you all received. To date, the city has invested $111,000 in the project. And this is, has been for the engineering, landscape architecture, flywheel industrial arts, another local business right here in Montpelier, Weston and Sampson environmental, archeology, span and the community engagement to inform the design. In addition to that, Vermont River Conservancy has invested $60,000 of funds that have come from businesses, that have come from individuals to support the initial designs and again, community outreach. So the total community investment that's gone into the project so far is about 171,000. Um, right now, in order to finalize the design, the um, next step, the project is currently at 80% design and the final cost to finalize the design is $15,700. The plan has been to also do the archeology span and the permitting at the same time. Um, and we could hold off on doing the archeology span and the permitting until we have fully assembled the implementation fundings to have that cost savings right now. So with $15,700 more, the city can have a shovel ready plan ready to be implemented as soon as the funds are assembled. And once the designs are final and it's clear that the project has the backing to move forward, um, the city can get $50,000 reimbursement from the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant that it currently has and get $50,000 back in their pocket. The design needs to be finalized and it needs to be clear that we're moving forward with the project. 
Um, I want to we're, to, we're here today to ask you all to reaffirm your support for this project um, so that we can final, uh, finalize the designs, get that $50,000 back in your pocket and move forward with the fundraising towards implementation. We're very close. We have just 25% gap and it's in sight. As I mentioned, I was in t on, on, the convert, on the phone with Christy Farnham with the Department of Economic Development. And she said, yes, there is funds. You can, that's an achievable gap. You can close the gap. There are strong, clear ties between outdoor recreation and infrastructure like this and a strengthened downtown business. And it's accessible to all. The fact that it has ADA ramps, seating areas, fishing platform, boat launch, is a huge fit for a lot of grant opportunities to provide equitable, equitable access to our rivers and near low income housing. We can get there, we're really close, and we'll leverage the Fit Cities investment fivefold through this project. And we're here tonight in hopes that you'll reaffirm your support for Confluence River Park. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna start by exposing my own ignorance and uh, <laughs> ask the first question, which is the, when I go by the river, it usually seems pretty shallow. Is it deep enough for kayaking and canoeing? Sure. Um, as part of this, we've assessed the depths of the river across there. Um, there. There are some ledge areas that are features out on the north branch. Um, if you look right under the from the bike path bridge under the trestle, you'll see that. But if you look right on the main stem, right in that spot, there's a really deep cut right in there. Um, so the river varies a little bit. There is some. There is a shallow bar spot that you'll be able to walk out on from Confluence Park. So it actually varies. Um, so, yeah. I'm but, not... if, but if someone put their boat in at uh, Caledonia Spirits, they could go all the way through downtown sure. without um, having to carry their canoe? Yep. And a lot of the sediment you see, is particularly upstream, upstream of um, Main Street um, behind the uh, Bailey Dam, is sediment that's trapped behind that dam. So when the flows get really low, um, you often see a lot of fine sediment in islands. Once, if and when the, that dam comes out, right, the water levels are going to drop in there as well, and that sediment would likely be removed as part of that project. Can we talk about the dam removal a little bit? Is that, that's, that's not part of this project, right? The dam removal is a completely separate project, but it is also happy, happening in parallel. So right now we have um, Vermont River Conservancy has funding for the feasibility studies, which is essentially the first step to figure out what, how much sediment is behind the dam, what's in the sediment, how could you take the dams out. Ray can speak to what happens in the feasibility study. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and an exciting part of that is, in fact, Marty, who's on the, the call, who um, Kasha had mentioned, He's on the team to look at what a what the paddler's trail could look like. Where are the white where could there be white water features to really expose the recreation opportunities? Because that to me that's one of the, the main reasons to take these dams out beyond lowering the local flood levels around these dams. Um, there's going to be an incredible opportunity for recreation to really mimic what's going on the, the success of the bike path. And one of the, the four dams are the Rat Dam or the Trestle Dam, which is on the North Branch immediately below the footbridge, the Bailey Dam or the Shaw's Dam that's right downtown right there. And then upstream is the Pioneer Street Dam, which is along the bike path. It's immediately the downstream of Wind River Environmental. That is a site that was a huge uh, brownfields mitigation project with super toxic, toxic carcinogens. They did the land remediation, but logic would follow that those carcinogens and the toxins that were on the land are also in the sediment behind the dam. And so there's an opportunity to clean up the river there. And then the final dam, the fourth dam upstream, it's called Hidden Dam. It is actually a little bit hidden. It's below U32. It's along the Cross Vermont Trail. And that um, each of these dams potentially creates um, opportunities to have access to the river as well. And I know in other communities, people will, you know, take their tube or their SUP board and strap it onto their bike trailer and bike up the trail, put their boat in the river, paddle downtown, and that kind of connectivity between our, you know, riverfront recreation up and down the corridor 
means that when there is a node right downtown, that's where people are going to be taking out their boats. And I, I was 10 years in Missoula and Mo Montana. Everybody is in the river tubing. You take out your boat downtown, and then you go out to eat at a local restaurant. You go out to the to grab a drink at the local brewery, and you're that is the business experience is part of the recreation experience and that's the value of having confluence park downtown connecting all these other opportunities and the feasibility study relates to all all these four dams yes okay okay thanks anybody have any questions so uh, just to continue on the dams what does removal of the dams do to the flow of the river of both the, the main branch and the north branch um, so these are small dams. Um, they're called run a river dams. There's mm -hmm. no controls on them. Most of them don't function right now. Um, the flow coming in is the flow going out of these small dams, unlike a dam like Wrightsville that stores water mm -hmm. and then slowly releases it. Um, so from a hydraulic perspective, as flow goes over these walls in the river, it's locally higher. So you take the dam out, the, the, the water level, the flood levels drop locally, particularly upstream of that dam. So from the Main Street Bridge up, when you see that whole pond and sediment, when a flood comes through, that's a little bit lower. Mm -hmm. um, the, the trestle dam on North Branch is a very small dam. It's actually got a big piece of it missing right now. So it's probably not having a big impact on the flood levels on the North Branch. Um, does mainly, it change the speed of the water and does that have an effect? Um, a little change of the speed of the water um, and part of the feasibility is understanding if that speed changes, um, how what will change around that area. But these are smaller dams, the speed won't change that much. Mm -hmm. That's to be determined to, to really understand that change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, you know, one of my concerns is that we, you know, we've just gone through this uh, 100 year flood. Um, and we're, we've got a commission studying um, a, a lot of the effects, but including the river itself. And it just seems that um, this is sort of, I mean, even though this has been in, in planning for several years and in a lot of city plans, I've, I've seen them, um, it's, it just seems to be putting the cart before the horse at this particular moment given what we're studying. I mean, we, we may need to do other things to the river. It, I see a lot of concrete here, for example, and I see a lot of concrete along the North Branch, and I think that's part of the issue. I'm not a hydrologist, but it just seems to make sense. We sort of squish the river into, a, into a, you know, where we want it to go, and it doesn't want to go there. And we're, we seem to be intent on building another plug here in a crucial spot. Why was this particular location chosen? I mean, I, I see a lot of ice banging into these yeah. terraced. I just wonder why on this confluence instead of on a straighter section further down or upstream, for example. Do you want to, I think there was two things of the flood resilience and why this place. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to speak to the flood resilience? Sure, the flood resilience, um, I guess what I'd say is the entire area of Confluence Park is currently filled. So we're actually gonna be pulling back pretty much as much as we can because there's infrastructure all around it. And to do that in this space requires all these walls. So, um, you know, the site, I think I, I completely agree with you. Some of, you know, as our historic development patterns land us all all over the state and the, really the country, we land in these river sure. corridors yeah. and we've closed off. And there's a trend right now of opening these corridors up in a place like Montpelier, that's gonna be very hard to do with all the infrastructure around there. This is actually one project where we're gonna to start to pull some of that fill out and create the space for this high water to sort of sit in this park. Um, so it's not a big change, but there's a little extra flood storage in this park than the fill that's there now, because that's all gonna get pulled back and terraced. So um, the idea, that's why it's a little harder. It's been designed to withstand the, the flooding. In so spot. what do you mean flood storage? I mean, there's a lot of hardscape here, right? So but right, you're, you're like removing, for example, in the platform you see on the land, there's, there's fill that comes straight off the bike path and steeply down to right at the edge there. Mm -hmm. So right now the land is like this, 
Mm -hmm. And when we're done, the land is going to be like it's going to be like pulled back a little which bit, which means that when the water gets real high, it can store right, it has more, this much more room. Water, so the, water. the turn is more gradual than it. Yeah. Yeah. And the river can flow by design over this flat area. Um, so, so the bottom of the stairs here, where does that correspond to the edge of the land that's currently at that spot? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to go to the aerial photo now? Yeah, maybe we'll just take a step back. That one. Yeah, so right here. So I'm trying to get the cursor. There it is. Can you, you all sort of see that? So it, it coincides um, pretty closely with the edge of land that you're seeing here. It might project out a little bit. Um, and then this fill and steep bank will be kind of cut back and that's where the terracing i don't um, see where you're pointing right now the cursor. Um, there it is again yeah you know, like so it will be right in here um i can we don't have those slides with you but we do have some cross sections that show this really vividly i can share share with the council um, and we were very mindful of even prior to July, the fact that this area gets very unique flood patterns because of the reservoir, the flood storage reservoir upstream on the North Branch. And confluence areas are, are typically not in this setting, but they're usually very dynamic areas. So you definitely do not want to be closing these areas off. Um, so we're basically trying to combine building a resilient park and opening up that area as much as possible with the bike path and the other infrastructure around there. And the other question you were asking was why this place? And I think the answer, one, there are many answers to that. One is that it's right downtown. This is the, like, if you look at it, if you, if you Google map like Montpelier in Vermont, it practically puts your cursor right here. Like this is right in the middle. And so it allows people to have that connection between the river access and the business community. And I think also, if you look back at several of the old plans, um, you know, this here in 2000, it's not the only green space along the riverfront. It's one of many. And we've built some of this in a way with the bike path. And this is kind of a critical node. And I think um, it also, the fact that it's at the confluence of the rivers, this is, that's where our community is. Montpelier exists here because it's at the confluence of the North Branch and the Winooski. So the cultural history from the Abenaki uses of the land at the confluence of rivers and rivers as uh, kind of the super highways and um, for trade and connection between communities and rivers being the historic region, you know, having using rivers for power to power industrial uses. Um, and so the fact that it's at the confluence, I think also shares a story with the community of why we are here in this place and what our geography is and how we as community relate to our rivers and our and our watershed. And I think that's really important. Something you said just <clears throat> reminded me of something we talked about the other day. You mentioned rivers being used for power. Were any of the dams on the river started out as uh, power generating dams or why are they there? Do you know, I know some of it. Um, yeah. Give it a shot. No. Okay. So the um, the 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 trestle dam, also known as the rat dam, the reason that's there is that the combined sewer overflow heading straight out from our homes and our sewage system straight into the river, when the water would dip below the sewer system, the rats would go into the sewer system and into people's homes. And that wasn't a real desirable condition. And so the rat dam was built to keep the water level of the North Branch at a minimum level so that rats would stay out of our houses. That's not needed anymore. Um, it was never built for power. The um, Bailey Dam by Shaw's, that dam I think was old, um, kind of small hydro industrial. Um, its current iteration um, is not that old. It's several decades old 
somebody probably on Zoom will, will tell me the history of it, but um, my understanding is that it was um, built actually um, as a, it, the idea was that they would have motorboats behind it speeding around in down, downtown. But the problem with that dam is that it doesn't hold water, it holds sediment. So they built the dam and almost immediately it filled up with silt and now it's just kind of this shallow backwater all the way back quite a ways. Um, and the um, Pioneer Street Dam, I don't know sure what the about. history of that one is. Yeah, but we'll find that out. That's part of the feasibility study too, is to learn the history of each of these dams. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Tim? I guess I do, um, so I started this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope so, come on. Yeah, so I, I guess I don't have any questions. I mean, I'm kind of looking at this, trying to piece it together and make sense of it. Um, and it was spurred for me by looking at the warrants, like we just signed a book of them tonight for expenses we pay. And items kept coming up for this and I thought it was a project that was on hold. So that's why I brought it up. And because it seems like we're spending money on a project that's gone from six, $700,000 range up to three point something million now. Um, and I very honestly just don't feel it's something we're gonna do. So I think as much as I appreciate your passion for it and all the work you've done, um, You've got this 0.1 acre piece of land that's in a very sensitive riparian zone. I'm really surprised the River Conservancy is willing to carve it up and build big retaining walls and, and, and do the things that are proposed. But nonetheless, um, you know, I think there are easier places along the river to create access, probably more cost effectively, that may be effective. You know, I'm looking at the community just invested in this new recreation path that I think does bring a lot more people near the water and, and it's really worked well. Um, which one? But if you look at it right now, it's pretty sad. The thing is covered with silt from the flood. We haven't done anything with it. It smells like a bathroom because we have a lot of unhoused people living down there. Uh, and it's just awful. I've had a lot of people say, I don't feel safe walking through there right now. Um, and I don't think creating this is going to be any better at the moment than what we've got up on top. I think we're just going to have more of that closer to the river. So I feel like it's a project that's spiraling and it's time to call it. And that's why I brought this up. Do you have a response that you want, want to make to that? Or, or, I don't know that or, or I'll call on a council member. It's not a question. Yeah. <laughs> Donna. Wait. Yeah, I mean, I've been, luckily I've supported this before I got on council. I'm going on 10 years on the council, I've supported it. I do think it's part of your vision and it keeps coming up. It came up in sustainable Montpelier. It comes up even as our meetings about the res responding to the flood, people want the river. But not, and, it doesn't have to be here. Or or letters, but, letters but when we did it here, I mean, some of the things that have been presented, I think this is the first time you've seen this. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I've seen it in all sorts of stages. And I also remember the people who came, I want to call them the White River Group. But they came because they were excited about this very important confluence piece and that they want to see the dams removed. And we had a good presentation on dam removal at that time. The council didn't vote to do it. Uh, and likewise, to actually think about not only having this space that goes with our housing at the transit center, as well as pulling in the rest of downtown, but also the fact that they just said, you put in a few more bolters and you've got white rotto. And then you've got really exciting events that you can have. And they, again, showed slides of where this had happened. And to me, that's where it is. It's an economic development. Yes, is it also outdoor recreation, which is also economic development, but it's a healthier place. And I think it. we do need more sitting space and we do need to all own it. Uh, I feel very fortunate that I feel like I can walk on the bike path anywhere. Uh, and I want more of that. And so I feel if we have a gold in the front of us, that this will take another $15,700 of our money and then fine, give them the 12 months that we had previously promised. And she's already down to 25%, very impressive. Uh, so I, I really support this. And I think that we saw a lot of uh, activity in emails of people who support it. But even before the most recent emails, all these studies are citizens who have participated and told us they really want this. So I think it's the right location. And there should be more happening afterwards. More. Do you see the hands on my computer? Yeah. Um, Carrie. 
Yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, I appreciate seeing kind of the latest thinking that you have on this. And um, I've seen this a couple times now as a council member, but I also remember seeing it as a just as a citizen of Montpelier before this. So I know that it's been part of the conversation for a long time. Um, I have a lot of really big questions and reservations about this project in general. But um, at this point, I feel like I'm, all of them, I just want to set them aside because the the primary concern for me right now is we just had this huge flood. Um, we're going to have another one. It's not a hundred year flood anymore. It could be a yearly flood. I don't know, but that we, we really need to reconsider our entire relationship with the river and with, um, and I think that our community is doing that right now. And we've had a lot of community conversations and I think it's really happening, which is great. Um, I, when we think about historical uses of this area and historical uses of the river, um, you mentioned the Ebeneke and everything kind of since then. The Ebeneke weren't putting permanent settlements by the river because they saw it flood. And I mean, I assume and um, didn't didn't try to change it to fit what they want, didn't try to put their desires onto it uh, ever since then, since Europeans have come in, we've decided we want to do this with the river. We want it to meet our needs and we want to change it and, and put our needs onto it. And so, I mean, that's getting a little bit, you know, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say, but it's a little non-concrete. Uh, but I, but I'm feeling very strongly right now, like what, what I'm learning from this flood experience that we've had is that we need to kind of step back from trying to encroach onto the river, trying to make the river do what we want it to do, trying to put our needs onto the river and just take a breath at least and say, for right now, we're gonna be thinking about ways that we can look at what the river needs to do and make it possible for the river to do that and suit our lives to that instead of the other way around. So we're not moving all of downtown away from the river at this point, but we're probably going to see a little bit less development downtown. We're going to see different kinds of development downtown. We're going to we're looking at, you know, people are having to make changes to their houses if they live in the flood zone because we're recognizing that we have to adapt to the river. So it may be that in the future we come around to decide that we need something like this. And at that point, if I'm still in city council, I'll raise a lot of the questions that I have about it. But um, for right now, I'm not at all comfortable with the city investing a lot more money into this project. I, I think I could be persuaded to put another 15,000 into it if that really does get it to a point where it can then be sort of like, say, okay, we, we've got some good plans, we're gonna put it aside for now and then maybe at some point come back and revisit it. But the $600,000 bond, um, that was originally approved by voters as something that was tacked on and folded into a lot of other expenses. I don't feel confident that the fact that that passed a town meeting means that there is a, there may very well be very strong community support for it, but I, that's not a convincing thing to me. We also had strong support for readjusting how we would spend that money at the, our last town meeting election. So if we're looking at the election results to indicate to us how people want us to spend that money, it's not clear to me at all. I don't, I don't so, so at this point, I, I, I would be open to the idea of finishing the planning process if it really is essential to get us to a point where we can say, okay, we'll stop now. And that's what I'm comfortable with at this point. Yeah. Uh, could I just ask what remains uh, to be done on the, on the design? The, the $15,000 would be spent doing what? Um, there's a little more work on the structural elements of the, the park, like some of the detailing of the walls. So the, the plans are currently at about 80% complete. These are construction plans? Yeah. Um, they will, I guess I call them um, final design plans because the once they go through permitting, they might get tweaked a little bit to mm -hmm. sort of make them, turn them into construction plans. So for that $15,000, it gets us to final design where um, there's a planting plan, some of the details on on what goes on the walls and some of the layout and the structural elements. There's just a little, there's a bunch of more details that were part of the budget that we just paused on once um, the flood happened and we kind of mm -hmm. heard about all this. So. 
Okay, good, and thanks. I, the, the reality of the plan is that if you leave a plan at 80% and say the community came back to it in a year or two years or three years, there's more work to go backwards to redo the engineering and redo the landscape architecture and figure out, it's you like putting your finger in the book and remembering where you left off. So there's a cost to that. And so getting the plans to final plans means that they're ready, assemble the fund, and you can, you can start doing the work. And so I think that's pretty important to make sure the city gets the best return on the investment they've made so far. Donna. I, I wondered if having finished plans also help you get that 25% you're looking to raise. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. So that's a piece, uh, you know, the funds that we need from here are implementation plan funds, not design funds. And so when they see that we have a plan that's ready, that's when those funders are ready to line up. They can see the vision and they can see what's happening. If they say, oh, you've still got a lot of work to do to do, build, build these plans, you're not ready this, for this, we can't even apply for those funds yet. So having the finished plans allows us to move forward with implementation funds. Um, and the, the plans, the way the, the current Land and Water Conservation Fund grant that the city has, um, the first deliverable in that grant is final design. And so once that deliverable is met, that's a point when the city would be able to request reimbursement if it's clear the project is moving forward towards implementation because it's not a planning grant, it's an implementation grant. And so if it's clear that we, if we met final design and we're moving forward with implementation, the city can put $50,000 back in its pocket. If we don't have those pieces, you can't ask for the reimbursement. I have a second part. Yeah. Uh, and this may go, Bill. Um, <clears throat> so where we left it, I thought was to finish this in before, before this, our last, you know, six months ago when we gave you 18 months but was to finish this this particular design and then you were going to have time to go get your money was there any other expenditure that was actually going to be happening so what we have in place now would pretty much fulfill what you wanted is that we're just going to do the if indeed we support doing the design then we're waiting for you to spend the 12 Five months and get your funding and then you come back to us and I would come back basically a year from now and say, here's so, the funding plan, we've right. got the money, this is what our commitments are. If we don't change our authorization today, is that correct, Bill? Is that what you understand? Yeah, we have permits with the council. The council said, we're not gonna put any more than 600,000 in. Yep. We're gonna give you, at that time, 18 months to come up with the rest of the project, complete the design, and do what you need to do. I do, I would, Stand to be corrected by council members, but I do think that part of that was saying, our, if you get the money, our plan is to proceed because they have okay. to go ask for money. You know, the, yes. it's a double part. Not only we're we getting a design, but we're proceeding. And I think the council was saying, if you get the money, our plan would be to go ahead with it. We're just not putting any more money in it. And I think what Kasha just said was, if we complete the design and it's clear we're moving forward, we can get the fifty thousand. Reimbursement. So I think the question that was raised okay. before the council at the last meeting is, is this still an active project? Should we continue moving forward? And that's the, the okay. decision you're discussing right now. And that's a, that's a real open question in my mind. Just hearing what people in the council have said tonight's meeting and our, our last meeting, I, I, don't, I don't think you have a majority of the council saying, we're committed to going forward with this if you raise all this money. And, you know, we haven't had a vote on that, so we don't know what's going to happen. But, uh, but what does that do to your, uh, to your fundraising efforts? Well, if I showed up here with a $3 million check and said I want to be able to build a park, and you said we're not building it even if you hand us $3 million, there's no point in getting $3 million. So um, it is... And I, every single grant opportunity is going to want to know that if the project is funded, that it's going to happen. They, they're trying to have, make a difference in this world. And whether it's the Brownfields funding and wanting to have an economic development, development impact on our downtown, 
for parks funding and wanting people to have equitable access to our rivers, each of these funders has a vision that they want to achieve through investing in this project. And so they want to know when they invest in this project that it can go through. And so, you know, I'm committed to raising the funds if we can, you know, if if we're going to move forward with this project. I can't I can't raise the money if I'm going to show up here. Even if I showed up here with a $3 million check and you still said, no, we don't even want your park, I can't raise that, that money. Mm -hmm. But you, what you, might be in a, you might be in a position of having the council say, a year from now, today we're, we may not be committing to, uh, to do this. A year from now, if we have the money, we'll be farther along in our flood resiliency thinking and discussions, we may think about it different a year from now. Absolutely. So, at, you know, between now, over the next 12 months, I have all these opportunities I lined up. I have a grant proposal I'm submitting tomorrow asking for $200,000. So I can do all of that. I think we, you know, I was on the, the people I've been on the phone with lately say, this is an exciting project. This is what Montpelier needs. Many of them say, I live in Plainfield or I live, you know, in communities. They're passing through and they say, I saw what happened to Montpelier. You guys were in a disaster zone and you need to bounce back. And they see this park as an opportunity to show up and say, you know what? We're not disappearing. We're not being like flooded off the map. We're not going away. We're actually going to have a vibrant downtown that, do, that, that has a healthy relationship with the rivers and has a positive place to connect with the rivers and engage with the rivers and says, you know what? Yes, we are in a community that's going to flood. It's gonna happen again, but we are resilient. And these are the kinds of, we also have a healthy relationship with our rivers and we understand that dynamic. And this is a real opportunity to support you know be part of the recovery and you know everybody in the community is looking for flood resilient infrastructure we're handing you designs for flood resilient infrastructure okay now palin i i because of the way we're set up it's hard to see you i, I just don't want to yeah, make I sure you sick, so i don't know if i can talk um thank you for your presentation <clears throat> and thank you for uh answering my question and sending email to me from like last presentation. And like last time, it's a great vision. I really like the idea, uh, but at the same time, I am also on the Montpelier Ally Board. And last couple months, all the meetings we are having and listening to businesses stories and also other people who were affected by the flood, even like $1 makes huge difference changing their stories so after like spending all all those months with them i don't feel comfortable spending money on this project right now but again i i really like the idea and i'm sure it will bring so many things but this flood and our limited budget i feel more responsible to um just focus on uh are like more immediate needs let me say but thank you for your presentation again okay donna i i guess i'm just so supportive of this project and i feel like <laughs> and that nothing else just just six months ago we made a commitment of 18 months and there are immediate needs that this six thousand dollars won't help at all you can't apply this everywhere that we want we can't do the repairs we can do new stuff with it but if you actually read even though we modified it we can't use this six hundred thousand and so we, over here I don't understand, so the money that we have bonded no have not yet bonded that the voters voted for for this part is not money that we can help unfortunately many of the needs that are due for the flood yeah so uh, it's six hundred dollars that invest in our future and without that when we get done with all the other repairing if we aren't making these constant steps forward to that vision it won't ever happen hubbard park didn't happen when it was needed it happened because people said we got a plan that land's going to be absorbed let's take some aside 
North Branch didn't happen without people planning. I mean, Bar Hill didn't happen without us planning. It cost the city money to do that, to have a partnership with that business. So I just feel like over and over again, our bike paths, you can say various times, it's too expensive, but if we don't invest in that, we don't have a shared use pass for people to use. So I just, just okay. want to bring that to reality. Mr. That's Mayor, all. can I say something? Yeah. So I share my opinion, and I don't think we need to respond to each other's statements. So that was my opinion, and that's what other people share with me. I didn't respond to any other city councilors' statements. So. I okay. think we should keep like that. Everybody should tell their ideas, questions. We shouldn't just say, oh, you said this, but this is like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry you took it that way. Also. Well, yeah. I see we've had a couple of hands up in the uh, out, out in Zoom world for, for a long time. So starting with Joe Castellano. And it'll take a minute to get on. There we go. There I am. Thank you. Thank you uh, for. Uh, acknowledging me and I, I appreciate you, um, you know, the presentation and everything. My input is, um, I think that right now it's not fiscally prudent for us to continue on with this project. I mean, it's going to cost us $5 million to just get City Hall back up and running. Certainly the flood has impacted the city's finances. So, you know, as much as I may be in favor of this park, um, as a citizen, I just can't see it being fiscally prudent at this point. The other thing too is um, I'm just also concerned that, um, you know, there is a homeless problem down there and I'm not sure whether this is going to be a place that even if the park is built, whether it will attract the families that you're hoping to attract there. Uh, the third point is I understand the currents there are somewhat challenging to put in. And then there is another, um, kayak and river access right near the high school, the Bill Haynes Memorial Access, which has got a, a great um, ramp to, to get uh, a kayak or canoe in. And so that's just my thought. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Marty. And you're- There we go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I. Um, I am working Sorry. with Kasha. Let me, let me oh. just ask you to introduce, identify yourself sure. before you start. Sure. Uh, Marty Parishand. Um, I founded a nonprofit in Franklin, New Hampshire that built a whitewater park, very similar. Um, I've, uh, it has been an agent of change here locally. Uh, Kasha kind of mentioned that Franklin, New Hampshire was the smallest and poorest city in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, and that was seven years ago. Um, this past um, uh, May, the most expensive condo sold in our county uh, was in Franklin, a $750,000 condo. Um, the Whitewater Park uh, is a driver. Um, Whitewater Parks are very similar to what you're discussing with Confluence Park. The difference is if there's a hydraulic jump inside the river that creates a surf wave that people can utilize every day. And although that's not in your design, uh, what I do know, uh, I've been at this uh, almost 10 years. Uh, the nonprofit was formed uh, seven years ago. What I do know is all of your concerns are, are very valid. Uh, I've heard them um, all the way down to the shape uh, of the river and the concrete. Um, and, and they all have positive benefits for the river ecosystem, but also your community. Um, here, I'll, I'll try to keep it super brief and answer any questions uh, that people might have. Um, here, we've uh, raised uh, three and a half million for our Whitewater Park. Uh, it's installed. <laughs> Um, it came to life uh, February of 2021. Um, and since then, uh, in 2015, when we got going, we had one restaurant in our downtown in a mile and a quarter. Uh, our our downtown's super small. It's not something to be compared with Montpelier, but the effects 
of what we're talking about should be a major consideration for you guys. Um, we had a one restaurant then. Uh, we have uh, nine that opened in the last 18 months. Um, it gives, uh, just like some of the people have said, it creates vibrant places people want to visit and they can visit for free, which is definitely uh, something. And what we've noticed uh, with the Whitewater Park, we intended on seeing a lot of users and enthusiasts, uh, but they're vastly outnumbered by the fishermen and the families. And, and those people want to walk the downtown. They want to grab a drink. Uh, they're going to go to the gas station uh, and they want to go out to eat or, or get a T-shirt. Right. All of those things, uh, commerce, restaurants, lodging, um, that's where you make money for your businesses, especially after the, the travesty that you guys are, are working with now. Um, the shape and the structure and the concrete, I, I get those concerns. I am most certainly an outdoor enthusiast. I, I would classify myself as a hardcore tree hugger. Um, the realization though is that these rivers worked or have been working for their communities for a very very long time uh, thankfully the permitting process in place will show if there's issues with the designs for the 100 and the 500 year floods right so you'll end up with a product that's better suited for flood situations than what you have now uh, that's why the bathymetry data is required that's why hydraulic modeling is required, uh, even computational uh, on some level. And kind of like Roy was explaining, with the terracing of it, you're creating more volume. Uh, that means the water level will actually go down. Uh, it won't be constricting it and going and having it go up. Probably the very last thing I would mention is... Um, you know, uh, the unhomed or the homeless. Um, it's certainly something every community is dealing with uh, across the country. Uh, that's that's a, a very large issue in and of itself. Uh, but what I've seen is the Whitewater Park sits on a very small parcel, very similar to what we're discussing with Confluence, about a mile, uh, excuse me, uh, 1.5 acres. Um, it was an underutilized property, kind of the gateway to our downtown. Uh, it gave people a place to walk to, a place to visit, but it wasn't utilized. Um, it had a large uh, retaining wall that prevented people from getting close to the river. Uh, in opening that up, it is now a place that sees activity every single day, uh, where uh, in 2015 it would have seen uh, homeless folks uh, camping there, uh, people bringing beers um, to sit with their friends, uh, and, and basically folks that were up to no good. Uh, we took it a step further, and upstream, we actually took uh, 13 acres of land uh, and then followed that project on with another project uh, of 18 acres for a total of 31 uh, all underutilized property, all in industrial ruins, um, all had very large homeless encampments. Um, and what we did is we created more traffic, right? More traffic is a form of uh, informal policing, right? The more people that use a bike path, the more people that use a waterway, the less likely others uh, who are up to no good or squatting on land that they don't own um, we'll find refuge there, right? So I, I wouldn't, you, you all have a considerable amount on your plate, um, but projects like this, it's not unique to Montpelier. Um, there is a huge trend across the country uh, where these projects are making positive impacts. Uh, riverside projects, whitewater parks uh, are happening everywhere. There's 300 whitewater parks in the country. Uh, but ours was the first one uh, in all of New England. Uh, we're we're just a little bit behind, in my opinion, uh, of this trend uh, across the country. And some states are, are, are much better suited for it, of course. Uh, Colorado is a prime example. For every dollar spent on a lottery ticket, 50 cents goes towards a bike path, a whitewater park, or a hiking trail.
Marty, right. I think I'm uh, cut you there. I think I I think sure. we're probably over the three minutes, but uh, oh, okay. But, but but thank you for your insights, uh, folks. Where are we? Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Does anyone have a motion to make? I'll move uh, that we discontinue the project and and. Uh, no what just discontinue it and no longer continue on as a project in the works. Second. Okay. Is there any further discussion? You know, we've we've talked we've talked about this a lot. Do we have any discussion on the motion? Carrie, you look like you're about to say something. Yeah. Um I mean, as I said, I have a lot of reservations and concerns and questions about this project. I'm not sure I'm ready at this point to vote to just completely get rid of it. Um, I think, you know, we did vote back in February that we were going to take 18 months to kind of see how things were and, and assess then. And I that still feels like a good plan to me. Okay. I, I don't know how I would, I'll feel at the end of the 18 months, but I, I would like to see that through. Yeah, I feel the same way. Uh, any any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. No. Abstaining? Uh, I don't want to vote tonight. Like Carrie. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's two to two, so the motion fails. Sorry, which way did she vote? She did, she did not vote. She said she wasn't prepared to vote tonight. Oh, okay. So that's an abstention. I got you right, didn't I? So if it's two to two, then do you vote? Um, I could or I could not. I'm not required to vote. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't pass. So the motion doesn't pass. Okay. Is there anything else we're going to do, or is that, that are we done with this topic? So, for clarity, we're keeping where it is. Yeah, and for the public and everybody else, um, you took no action essentially. Yep. So the policy and decision from last February is still the standing policy and action of the council. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it is. Until you change it, that's what it is. Yep. So. I think we're here at no obligation to proceed. Yeah, would you restate what, what the policy so the, is? The council said. said that's, that's what, <laughs> I'm trying to, I'm not yep. trying to push you in any direction. I'm trying to make sure everyone walks out of here knowing what, with the same expectations. City council voted last February that they would not spend more than $600,000 on the project. They authorized them to complete the design and to and gave them 18 months to get the money with, and if they did not have enough funding at that point, basically wouldn't continue. I think the, I don't know if it was explicitly stated and uh, let me just finish what I'm saying and then I'll, okay. I'll be happy to take any corrections. Uh, what's that? Well, let's let, let, let's let him finish. So, that was basically then um, at least my inference was that if they got the money, we would proceed. But now we've had a conversation. There was a vote to discontinue it that didn't pass. So there's been no action since then that would change the last February's action of the council. So if there's a, if I got the clarity wrong, that's fine. We can always go back and look at the motion that was made last February. I'm also happy to listen to people's views. I'm not trying to push it one way or the other. Okay, Carrie. So I have the motion. In front Beautiful. Of me. <laughs> uh, um, so what we voted for was to hold six hundred thousand dollars that was previously approved by the voters for at least eighteen months, and during that time we receive updates and could reconsider the situation. So uh, I think that's what we decided to do and sort of our we might all have different memories or senses of what our intent kind of was. Um, and we also have 
some new members of the council since then, but that's what we decided to do was that we're not going to spend any of that we're, that six hundred thousand dollars, which we don't have yet. We haven't we haven't bonded for it, but we decided we're going to wait on that. And so that's where we still we, are. We have the opportunity to reconsider. Yes, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So implementation is not a given. It's right. not. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the motion good. that passed is what counts. Yeah, I think that's a great work to have that carry because that that's 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 our decision yeah. on record. So that remains the decision. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Thanks everybody who came and spoke, and thank you to all the people who sent us the emails. I appreciate that. And now and it. One clarification, like just the, so it's Mike Miller again. So what we've already decided on. So there's no staff working on this project right now. Just so everybody understands, there's nobody working on this project. It is all being worked on by the consultants and by the River Conservancy. So we're. It, it, it's not affecting any of our workloads. Um, and what we've decided is they are only going to work on getting to the 100% of the design. If, if there wasn't a change tonight, we have made the decision of not advancing permitting or archeology span until we have full funding and we come back and have a green light to go to implementation. So there is only that window of, I guess, $15,000 to complete the project um, the River Conservancy is not being paid to do the work of doing all this homework to try to find the other grant. So we're not expending money. They're doing that out of their own work. So as we're going forward, as this project is still moving forward, it is it, the, 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 really the only money that's going to be expended now is just going to be the 15000 to complete the design work that was already in their contract. We already have a contract with them to do that. So. Just so okay. everyone's clear, that's so, that's where we're at. So if that's already in their contract, then that is not a change. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But in their contract was also going to permitting and um, archaeology, mm -hmm. and we've told them we're not going to go to permitting and archaeology, and they've agreed they don't believe we should go to permitting and archaeology until we have all the funding and the full green light to move forward, and we would build those two steps into the final. Um, final the final basically the bid doc when we go to bid those last two pieces we go into those bid docs so okay thanks make sure everyone understands that that's from a staff standpoint we haven't really been expending any effort on this project it's all been done by our consultants and by the river conservancy so great thanks okay now it's time for our uh 10 minute break so it's 6 30 8 38 now so to 8 48 so well, we've got clarity. Hmm? We've got clarity yeah, yeah. of where we are. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, one of these things. Is these images? While we're waiting for Kelly to tease this uh, um, stall, uh, so this is the. Of a, and we're a little bit late because of the flood, but this is the strategic plan that they uh, adopted last year. And this is the wrap up of kind of how we did the scorecard, so to speak. And it, it was a good lead in, I think, for your conversation next week when you start to lay out the new goals and priorities and plan for the upcoming year and for the upcoming budget. So it would give you a chance to see. I know you've had a chance to look at it, how it's laid out, the types of things that are in it, uh, and all that. And, while we're talking about that, I was going to say that at the end, but we will be meeting next Wednesday at the Senior Center. That's where our meeting will be held. And I think we said 530. Um, so just Great. And, and we're having pizza or something? We're having some. Yes, we'll get, we will get a menu. We'll have Mary see if, what people can and can't eat. Sometimes we have eating yeah. requirements. We have to check about that. Which I appreciate as someone on the pickier end of the spectrum. So. <laughs> I appreciate because I'm one of the pickier people on the spectrum. So, all right, are we ready to go? We're good now. Great. All right. Um, so I've prepared a quick presentation um, to just go over in summary um, where we ended the um, 2023 strategic plan. 
um, and also provided some details for you to consider um, as we move forward with the next um, strategic planning time period. And I'm, just, I'm just trying to advance my slides here, hold on. I'm just gonna move along this way. So as you recall from the slides, um, these are all of our goals. Um, and so for our plan, uh, just looking at these, just wanted to refresh memories. Um, and then as we move on here, um, I wanted to also share what um, the uh, structure looks like of our strategic plan. Is this big enough for folks to see? Okay, good. Um, and so you can kind of see how our plan is laid out using this um, public health and safety emergency management example, which, you know, currently it's pretty important uh, to be looking at that. Um, and then on into the next summary here, I just wanted to pull out the prioritized strategies. I'm not going to read through all of them. I'm just going to kind of cruise right along here. Um, but I also wanted to highlight them for the purposes of this presentation so you could see them again. Okay, so here's where it gets kind of neat. I'm going to go out to our public facing dashboard right now. Um, and so in your packets, you did have a uh, report that was in writing detailing all of the things that we did. So this is just a visualization of those results so you can kind of see those. And so what I'm gonna do is walk through each of these goals um, that we have and highlight areas where, you know, there's um, a black bar, which means that something was uh, discontinued and we weren't able to complete that task. So I wanna highlight that because you may want to consider those items in a future strategic plan, or you might want to leave them right where they are. Um, if you see a green or a blue bar, that's really good. We've either completed it or we are well on our way to completing it. If you see a yellow or red bar, there is either a disruption or a major delay. And so I'll also cover some of those items as well. So taking a look at um, this first one here, um, improving community prosperity, just kind of cruising on down here to the bottom section here. You can see how well we've done with this particular goal. It's kind of a, a mixed bag. Um, we've actively supported economic development that's on track. Um, and so while the progress here may not you know, seem as significant, we are um, working to that end. Um, we are working to actively support childcare options, but we have had some delays um, in that category. Um, what I do wanna highlight here is this um, new economic development plans. We do have 60% of this being discontinued. And so I just wanted to drill into that a little bit so you could see exactly what we're talking about here. So um, incentivizing new businesses to serve working class residents, um, we, are working on initiatives to that end, but we didn't feel as though we had something that could really speak to this, and so we discontinued it. Um, we reviewed economic development strategic plan and determined priorities, but we, because of where we were at within the process, we actually didn't end up um, completing that item. Um, we did complete the economic development activities and provided funding for that, um, and then we did not work on tax stabilization, which might be something that you would consider in a future plan. And then we did complete our review and evaluation of the TIF program. And Kelly, just, just to be clear, what we're looking at is what any member of the public <laughs> could look, could see by uh, going to our city's webpage. Yes, correct. And how often are these uh, updated? With each quarterly report. I'm gonna keep moving through the goals just so we can kind of drill down a little bit so you can kind of see where things are. There is more detail provided in the report in the packet. Um, so in this, this area here, um, to provide responsible and engaged government um, in terms of communicating effectively, there is you know some really good news there, but we also did have um, a black bar, which is a discontinued item, and this was to increase coordination with the neighborhood groups. Um, we unfortunately were not able to do that. We did work with um, CAN as long as we could through sustainable communities, but that effort was discontinued because they were no longer um, sort of viable. So we're going to continue to look to you know at other initiatives for that. Um, but 
just wanted to note that. And then um, looking at um, utilizing MPD's community resource officer position. So we are working um, to do that. And we also, I think, hopefully you'll agree, have improved the functionality of the website. It's a work in progress. We will continue to work on content. Are you okay with taking questions or comments while you go along? Sure, yeah. I, I was just talking to someone recently who said, well, I can never even find what what the agenda is for a meeting. And we should always be able to get to the agenda within two clicks of the web, uh, going to the web page. And so I went home and looked at it and I said, well, okay, click one. Once I'm on the city's web page, click one was go to agendas. And then click two was scrolling down to the council or whatever committee it was for and the second click would be would get us right to the agenda so mm -hmm. i think it i think we're there with a lot i think it's better than people think it is and the video instruction really helps a lot <laughs> you know i mean thank you for that uh, feedback and i also think that there are opportunities to improve further um and you know if we can get people to the information that they're looking to get to one of the things that we are looking at is the analytics behind the website to see where people are going so that the website is a little bit more dynamic you know people are coming to our website for information for you know documents of record they're not coming to kind of like hang out and peruse all the items and so we want to make sure that we are um, improving that where we can um, so one of the areas that I would like to look at in the future is looking at the content, making sure that it's up to date and um, everything that is needed is there right at your fingertips. And so we're working to that end. Um, so the next one here to kind of drill into is um, this create more housing um, items. I'm going to scroll down here. And, you know, we are looking pretty good in this area. Um, we have made some gains. Um, especially when it comes to available housing units, they're you know, not complete. It's a work in progress. And so some of these things we're not gonna be able to say, done. <laughs> but you know, I think it's also a good indicator of where we're at at this point and what that looks like. And get into more detail, um, but I'll keep moving unless there are specific questions related to these items. Okay. Um, and so moving on here, I'm So this next one, practice good environmental stewardship. Um, we have had some good um, progress. And so I think, you know, we are definitely on track when it comes to addressing impacts of climate change and expanding parklands. Um, there are a few items here that you can see that don't necessarily have um, status bars attached to them. And we do have updates, but they're not captured within this plan. Um, and so we can work to get that done, but I just wanted to highlight them. Uh, working on green practices for the cemetery, which I know is happening for sure. Um, developing the Youth Conservation Corps. They were a real lifesaver during the flood um, and also have been doing some amazing work in the parks. And so I did wanna give a shout out and mention it because I, I do think that it's something that is so important for our community. Um, and then we are working on the home energy ordinance. And so there'll be more um, to come on that, just not represented here since it's a relatively new initiative. Um, moving right along here. This one I think we'll be spending some time on now and in the future. Um, this is our infrastructure goal. Um, and you can see that there are a few items here that are delayed or are significantly disrupted. And um, so just starting with the first one, address new or improved um, infrastructure needs. And so when you drill down into this, you can kind of see outlined here um, where the disruptions are. Um, but I also would argue that we are working towards these goals and that's why it's not being discontinued. But just to highlight them, produce plans to support the construction of a public restroom, uh, recreation building, renovation, explore and develop new recreation center options, actively pursue creation of <laughs> recreation open space facilities at 203 Country Club Road, and anticipate a uh, process for future 55 Berry Street Recreation Center. And you know, there's definitely more to come on these. Um, so I think that that's why we're showing a yellow, but we wanted to really actually highlight that so that you know it's something that we still need to continue to work on. Um, 
And then also within this category is um, developing rec center options, which we're on track with, um, and we'll have more for you soon on that. And so on into the next category, investing in um, long-term public works infrastructure plans. You can see that this is yellow and red. Um, and so some of this, um, if you look at the major disruption here, um, it's you know related to where we're at with some of the projects. Um, we are following our plan. Um, However, there have been delays related to whether it be staffing, funding, you know, or a variety of conditions. And so in this category, we are delayed and we will need, need to continue to talk about it as we talk about the capital plan, especially during this next budget cycle. So I wanna highlight that um, for you. And then um, this next one is a yellow bar. Um, this initiative is to create a snow melt system with district heat and so it's something that is I'd say within the idea phase that we've been, you know, kind of shopping around um, and, you know, we'll see if that comes to fruition or not, but it's identified there for you. Um, and so the next one is uh, city funding strategies. You know, um, you can see where we're, we're showing some major disruptions here, sufficient funding to attain and maintain at least. 70 um, pavement condition index, which is pretty important. It's a goal that was set by council, and you know we are trying to adhere to that. Um, however, you know as we're doing our uh, pavement plans, you know we have been delayed due to funding and coming back from the pandemic and covering that ground. Can I just oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. Some of these infrastructure plans have turned red since the flood because we've had to put them on hold given our financial situation. So even projects that were planned to be completed this fall and spring, we, we've had to stop until we know, have a better sense of our finances. So they're, they're not all, some of these were not necessarily as dis disrupted perhaps last quarter as they are mm -hmm. now. Um, and so the next one is the creation of a stormwater utility. We've definitely done some work on that, but it also has been delayed. Um, and then expansion of district heat. Um, we are looking at that, um, but there's also some disruption there. With regard to the district heat, I think there were some controls that were uh, damaged in the flood. Is that gonna be up and running for this heating season? Yes, um, there is gonna be some delay, but uh, People, people can get heat now if, they, if they're ready to take it. Um, not everyone is, um, but our control systems will probably not be fully functional. To, so we'll be able to provide heat, that's not a problem, but we, there's a precision of control that we probably will have within two to three weeks. Uh, we might have to do some manually. We're not sure we're gonna be able to get the full uh, fiber optic network back. So we might have to do it by internet or some other way but it's definitely in the works and we can provide the heat we can give people the customers that need it it's just some some are slowly coming you know some are up and running now others are on their way back is that insured hmm? was that insured covered by insurance or not Question for us three, yeah well i we listed that as one of our public asset damages yeah. for us but it's still the time it's you know some of these aren't it's not financial so much as it is just getting the parts and the pieces yeah. that you need to put it back together in the short, you know, I mean, it's, you know, do, the flood happened in July, Get as, as Tim was mentioning, you know, just getting his buildings up and heating in, yeah. in, in typical fashion, just it's a short turnaround time. And that's actually, we, we were pretty active trying to talk to folks who had damaged uh, furnaces if they wanted to convert but and many were interested but there just wasn't enough turnaround time to get in and with the ordering to get all the pieces in that you need the heat exchangers and the meters and those kinds of things so but that's all part of our FEMA claim that yes. we got in yes well not not the potential new business no but it's right. reimbursed yeah, yeah. And then with our last goal here, improve public health and safety. Um, there are uh, no discontinuations, no red bars. So this one's looking pretty good as well. 
Um, we've been actively working um, to address homelessness within the community. Um, and so you can see that looks um, pretty, pretty solid. Um, we are um, providing policing which fits Montpelier's need for effective mental health. Um, we just did uh, hire for um, the clinical social worker position, and so that's happening, so we're able to support that. Um, we are disaster ready, although I would say there are a lot of things to be gleaned and learned from our most recent experience. Um, and so this one for sure is something that we'll be taking under advisement in the future. Um, and the next one, um, continue public safety planning. Um, and so th that's looking pretty good as well. Um, so that's what the, the goals look like visually within our dashboard. Again, I'm happy to drill down into anything if you'd like um, or take questions based on what's in the report. Um, but just heading back to the slides here, I wanted to take the time and opportunity to kind of look at, you know, maybe some next steps. That seems good. Okay. And so this next slide um, that I wanted to show you, and this one is a little bit small, so I apologize for that. Um, let me see if I can just blow it up a little bit. Is that a little bit better? Um, so this slide is from the um, citizen survey, the community survey that we did last fall. And I wanted to bring this forward to you just so that we can kind of take a look at some of the um, inputs from the community and some of the things that were important at that time. Um, we are doing these benchmarking studies to really provide the data for strategic planning to give us, you know, a guide and how we might approach certain things. And so you can see um, that there is a column um, where it shows sort of the similar or lower or higher and that's against the benchmark and that ranks us against other communities nationwide so we can kind of see generally how we're doing um, and so just to highlight areas where we are lower or higher um, overall quality of utility infrastructure is lower than your benchmark community um, residents connection and engagement with the community is higher which is fantastic and then um, this uh, overall feeling of safety is a little bit lower, but you also need to take a look at, you know, what the percentage rating is there and kind of think about, you know, what that means for the community and whether or not that's something that, you know, is still at 70%, which is still pretty good. So this just kind of provides a guide, I think, in terms of, you know, where we're at, you know, what the community thought when we did this survey last fall, but I think it's still good information as we consider the next strategic planning process. And then moving forward, this just highlights some of the lower or higher benchmarks. Um, the bolded text here are items that were in the um, current strategic plan. And so we did work on these things. The ones that are not bolded, that might be lower than benchmark, say, and might be items that you would want to consider would be you know, ease of public parking, residential growth, overall quality of new development. Um, and then there are some things that you know we may not offer as a community that others would um, nationwide, such as garbage collection or, and we do to some extent do some yard waste pickup at certain um, times of the year. Um, but if you look at the higher than benchmark items, we're doing pretty good, I'd say. Um, but just to <coughs> highlight those items for you. Um, and then this particular slide I think is very interesting because um, this takes when we did the um, survey in 2009 and when we did it in 2022 and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to do this again uh, next year um, so that we will then have another data set to work with but at least for these two time periods we can compare where we were. And so what I did is I extracted the items where we may have lost some ground in 2022 just so that you can kind of see you know what that looks like um and so just as the note says here if the difference between 2009 and 2022 survey is greater than six percentage points the change is statistically significant and so it's just something to consider um and so you can see here you know um there are some highlights for sure recreation centers or facilities 70 3% in 2009 to 51% in 2022. Um, or looking at the street repair, you know, 32% in 2009 and 2022. I mean, I think 
some of these things are things that we, we already know. It hangs together. You know, we're not seeing anything new here, but it does highlight areas where we could potentially focus um, areas. Um, housing options is another one, but we're working on it. I mean, we've got, you know, some new developments in town, and so it would be really interesting to see what the next survey would present. Um, and so the other things that I did pull here was um, a comparison of the city of Montpelier services and federal government services and how those were ranked. Um, and so for city services, um, you know, we did see a decrease, but we're still over 70%. And so that's, I think, good to highlight. And then, you know, federal government was at 43% in 2009 and 36% in 2022. Um, and then there are a few items here that we did ask on this survey um, this time around in 2022 that we did not ask in 2009, um, but I think are also important just to consider um you know such as confidence and our own local government here and then also overall direction um and so just want to put that there um and then this next one was more of an open-ended question we were able to ask a few specific questions as part of the survey and so you can kind of see in order here what people were thinking again no surprise um but as we look to the future and what we might put in the next strategic plan as you head into that development process next week. You've got some things to consider there and, you know, backed up with some of the data that we have. So this next slide um, and one of the things that I would like to bring into the process as we go forward um, is to look at um, piloting some um, performance measures or indicators so that we can really get our arms around how well, how much, is anybody better off? Um, and provide you with that context and then also consider some performance standards so that we can see if we're meeting the community's expectations. Um, and so we have some of those factors in our current strategic planning process, such as like PCI, or there are some really good public safety statistics that we could pull from, which will be helpful, I think, as we look at some of our strategic planning elements and consider, you know, are we moving the needle or not? Are we doing what you intended? You know, how can we, you know, make things happen? Um, so that's what I have for the presentation. Um, and if you have questions or if you need more detail, I'm happy to provide it. Thanks so much, Kelly. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Okay, thank Thanks. you. I'm curious what the process will be next week. Uh -huh. Do you want to? I'm a little well, curious of what the process will be next week. Mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, uh, Paul Costello is facilitating it. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be uh, so. I and he's out of town this week, so I can't uh, can't touch base with him. But when we talked, I think it's going to be uh, getting a sense of what everyone's sort of top priorities are, laying them out, picking major, you know either saying, are these the same, or do you want to pick up big topics and then talking about key initiatives? I mean, the idea is to create a plan and set your goals and priorities and then key action items. We'll get as far as we can in the time that we have, and if we have to follow up more the following week, we will. You don't want to overdo it. Um, so it's a, it's a, I think it's going to be a, for anyone who's ever done a planning, goal setting, priority process, it's going to look like that. You know, we've not we've not used Paul for this before. Um, Are you feeding us? <laughs> yes. Yes. Carrie. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. I'm. I've been through processes like these, like this before. I don't know if this is actually working. I, that won't help. Oh, won't help. Okay. This is. I'm just. just my ears are plugged up, so I'm oh, hearing very well. That's all. Um, I've so never you. seen a process like this get done in one meeting. Right. I mean, it's. We, you cannot possibly do something like this in one meeting. Right. So I'm also curious about how it's going to go. And I'm also wondering if the assumption is that this structure, the way we have our strategic plan structure now, is what we're going to use or not, or what. I would love so to see something would, ahead of time. And, and, and the social, social and Economic Justice Committee has also asked to see something ahead right. of time, and I haven't been able to provide it to them. Um, so I'm wondering if that might be possible. So there's a lot there. So uh, we don't expect it will be completed, completed. Um, right. Usually what happens, the council lays out kind of a mishmash of things and there's usually some direction to it and we try to write it up 
and bring it back to the council. Try to reflect back what we think people said, and then we take it. And if we need more time, we need more time. It's your plan. You know, we should do it right. I mean, this is an important statement. So, uh, so I think that's important. As far as structure, I mean, we do. I think the only structure is I think the the, the notion of the you know what's like we want to improve infrastructure. Okay, that's like a big goal. And then what are some of the specific steps we want to do? That structure is kind of how our software I mean, is set up and how we measure things. The content doesn't have to be, you know, you could pick those six top things could be a six entirely different things. And then what we dig down underneath. And it doesn't mean necessarily we're not going to do the other stuff. It's just really what's the top priority. Because remember, in another month to six weeks, we'll be doing a budget. And we're going to try to provide a budget that, represents the top priorities. Um, so, you know, I can imagine you know, flood resilience will be one of the topics that isn't on there now, or, you know, who knows what else they, they might be. Um, and again, it's, I, it's it's yours, not ours. We'll, we'll have staff people to answer questions and provide information about what we're doing on certain things. Um, but really, it's up for you to say these are the, the most important issues and some of the big projects and things we want to see to move them forward. So, you know, I mean, we wouldn't expect you to get down in the weeds and say, you know, we're going to clean five miles of sidewalk every week or those kind of things. But, you know, I mean, you would say we want to have a clean downtown or something. Like That'll be up to us to put the meat on that. You know, you just got to say these are things that are important. So, I hope that helps. Bill. Yeah. Um, I agree that. It won't finish in one night. It might take longer. But I think it's a good start, especially if we had a chance to talk about our priorities. Then when we make a decision, we will have some kind of, right. like a, I will say, gu guideline, right? Yeah. yeah, we are saying yes or no, because we already discuss and talk about our priorities and what's the most important thing, at least for this year for us. So. I mean, I think the highlight, the thing about next week is going to be that you don't have anything else on the agenda. So it's your time. It's really one time that you have to spend an entire evening just talking about what's important to you, not other stuff. And so with with someone who can help facilitate the meeting, so the mayor can you know, participate as a member without having to run a meeting, and you know, someone who knows the community, knows the issues. And then, you know, we have, we fought. You know, might take the next meeting, might take the meeting after that to finalize it, you know, it's, you can have another special meeting if you want. You know, it's really, it's it's important, you know, as I said, everything's a little bit behind. We probably would have normally done this, you know, started it in September or so and be finishing it now, but, um, so try to, you know, I, I don't, we're not going to try to jam everything in if you don't feel like you're done at the end, we, it's, that's fine, you know, it's, it's, but hopefully we'll at least have some of the big you know, work from the sort of where we're trying to get to and then how we get there and the, the airplane flight, right? You know, where do we want, we want to go, how fast do we want to get there, how much do we want to spend? So uh, can, I, can I speak? Yeah. Uh, when um, in the past, when you had that kind of workshop for Cedar Plain, have you invited uh, committee chairs? Excuse me? Have you invited committee chairs, city committee chairs, when you have a... We have done it both ways. We have invited committee... One time we invited committee chairs, um, and it was really unwieldy. I don't, don't know that we would choose... It was nice, but it was also really okay. um, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so usually, I think what we've tried to do is if there are committee priorities, have them come in through the council rep to those yeah, committees. Yeah, through us. And, okay. And okay bring them in that way um, and you know staff people who will it's not our place to tell you what your priorities are to but it's you know we could like if someone were to ask you know so, so say public safety was a topic you might say chief what are your top priorities for your department this year and you know or you might say you know what issues are you seeing with whatever and drugs and what can we do to support that? Is, is that a big problem? Should that be a high priority for us or not? You know, and, the, and then, but in the end of the day, you you have to respond to what you're, we're here to be your resources, but not to tell you. But there also doesn't mean that just because it doesn't end up on your top list that he's not going to do drug enforcement. Mm -hmm. It just means 
that maybe we're not going to put extra budget money and extra resources and all that sort of thing into it because it's such a huge problem that it's got to be a top priority. Thank it's you. One example. Donna. Um, just a couple of years, we had the council meet and do their priorities, and then we had the heads of departments do it separately, and then we came together. That was very, very beneficial. I really appreciated that interchange and looking at priorities and doables. I don't know. Maybe at that meeting, we can decide that we want to do that next step as a group. Right. So um, you may recall, initially, we talked about doing the, the strategic planning meeting tonight. And we have, we have our team meeting is next week. So that the original plan is we were going to be doing the strategic planning with you all tonight. And then we were going to and, and then come back at a future meeting. So we're, we'll probably be laying out, the team will be laying out its sets of priorities next Wednesday. Those will be available for you. I think most people will attend. I think we understand it's not staffs. I mean, I'd probably weigh in, but I, you know, it's not really staff unless you want to hear from them. Um, but they'll be there because everyone's interested in what you have to say, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if there's a follow-up, you know, we, we want to engage in a way that's helpful to the council, not telling the council what you need to do. But on the other hand, there's things you don't know, right? So you make, you know, there's, you have a sense that there's an issue with something you want to know more about, so. Very. Um, would it be possible at this meeting next week, we're meeting here, right? No, we're at the yeah. senior center. Oh, at the senior center. Okay, so wherever we meet, I'm wondering if it might be possible for that meeting to arrange our tables and our seating so we're all yes. kind of sitting around one table and not, you know, yelling across the room right. to each other. No, at, um, that, I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> okay. So right. that is possible. Okay. Um, in fact, Mayor and I talked a little bit about this. This really is a council work session. And it's, it's gotta be open to the public. It will be, you know, streamed. But typically, other than the required public comment at the beginning of the meeting, typically the council has just engaged in their own conversation and with staff as invited. It's not uh, open public, you know, because when you have your final plan, it will be on the agenda to be approved and discussed in public and people can comment. And obviously people can weigh in if they, you know, to let you know in advance or how, what they think priorities are. This is really intended to be a work session. So the, even when we've done it in council chambers, I mean, last year we kind of did it quick, but prior, we just probably would do it either in the memorial room sitting around the table or even we used the council community room, we used VLCT's conference room. We've tried to be in a different place even out of the council chamber and have, so that it, it is a, a working session. Yeah, this is especially hard with the straight line. Yeah. Uh, I cheat a little bit. Sure yeah. All right, are we ready to move on? Okay. It is time for council reports, I think. Start on your end, Donna. No comment. All right. I do not have a report tonight. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't have much of a report. I, the Housing Committee is um, trying to come up with a um, criteria that they can use to write RFPs and evaluate proposals for housing. And they've asked the Energy Committee, they've got priorities for all the other stuff, but when it comes to energy, they they're at a loss. So they've asked the uh, Energy Committee to do some research on that. And we're, um, we're, getting, cl <laughs> we're getting close. It's harder than it sounds. Uh, they, right, all they need right now is a general statement. Um, and I think it's going to have something to do with above code. Priority will be given to above code, uh, proposals that include above code measures. Um, but then if you need more specificity, it gets Pretty touchy, but anyway, I've been sort of buried in uh, energy code for the last couple of weeks. But we should have something of them. I mean, but it was interesting working with the two committees together. It's a good thing to do, I think. Yeah, yeah it's been fun. So they're good folks. Thanks, Tim. 
Uh, I guess my report is maybe what you all know, but it, it's kind of nice every day to see businesses gradually opening downtown. And mm -hmm. uh, had our first dinner out at Julio's Friday night. That was kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Be back in the old places. So uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of positive energy downtown, and thank everyone for supporting it. Uh, I know Montpelier Foundation, Montpelier Alive have done a great job distributing funds out uh, that, that everyone donated in. It's, yeah, it exceeded two million dollars, and mm -hmm. it just it's really impressive and I think we're seeing results for it so thanks um, I want to share one of the projects uh, Montpelier High School is doing um, uh, during their annual fall harvest celebration this year um, next uh, Thursday I think it is October 19 high school students will come to downtown and they will help businesses uh, whatever they need from them because their um, team for this year is community resilience so they are helping their community and um, helping businesses to recover a little bit more from the flood so I just want to thank Montpelier High School teachers uh, uh, staff and most importantly students our young generation taking the responsibility and uh, choosing their time to spend with uh, my, uh, downtown businesses and helping them. So that's all from me. Thank you. Mayor's report, I have very good <laughs> report. I also really appreciate going, being downtown, being able to see businesses open. I've had a family visit two weekends in a row, been able to go down to have uh, meals, do shopping. Um, one of the stores, her uh, business, they are great praise for Councillor Heaney and everything he's done to get his building uh, back and running. Credit where credit is due. It's great that this whole, the whole building is open. And, and really, every week and just about every day, new businesses are opening back up. And, and it's uh, very, very encouraging. Um, I'll also mention to uh, members of the council that Possibly next week, uh, it'll be time to do uh, council pictures for the annual report. Uh, Bill and I talked about that, so so dress up. Get your Halloween costume out early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we might be able, might be doing it next week at our before our planning thing, and I don't know if we've identified who's going to take the picture, but we'll figure that out. We'll we'll figure that out, but. Uh, I'm going to do a bang-up job last year. Yeah. Whoever has the best bond. Right. <laughs> and that's all I've got. City uh, Clerk. I'm here about the meeting tomorrow night. Um, for the Forest Civil Authority, the meetings are getting meatier now. But I think if we can, you know, sort of focus in and stay on track, we should be done before Thanksgiving. So. Great. Um, so I've got a few things actually, bear with me. I already talked about the strategic planning next week at the Senior Center, 5.30 with meals. Apparently we have to dress up because we're gonna get our pictures taken. <laughs> um, while we're in that neighborhood, we, we, I did forward to you the, uh, the engineering, the study about 55 Berry Street, the rec center. Uh, Tom Bachman will be here on the 25th to walk through that with us. So if you have questions, just to get it, you know, uh, I mean, I know you can all read it, but it'll be good to have him go. You, you, you have forwarded that to us? Yes. Oh. Last week. I can make sure you have it again. I might have missed it. I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah. Um, so that's available. But again, I think having him explain it before we get into the meat of it will be really helpful. Uh, Let's see, uh, we have some good news, some exciting news to announce. Uh, we will be, we're doing some more office moving. Um, we're going to move our finance office from the police department back into City Hall, um, in part because we're getting heat tomorrow, and in part because the air quality in their side of the building is now okay to be back in. We are not gonna be doing any renovation in that building. So it's still gonna be the rough floor, the rough um, sheet rocking, and it may or may not be their final place, but for now we're moving them back into where they were. Montpelier Alive is going to move to where Kelly and Evelyn were, so they have a, an independent suite. Kelly's gonna move into 
uh, Montpelier Live's office. Planning is going to then move into the police station where the police, where the finance currently is, and that will free up the second activity room space at the senior center. So both of those will be uh, free. And uh, Chief Nordenson, I just got to get into him, he's been really accommodating about having the folks in the, the um, police station. You know, that means people buzzing in and out and, and all. And actually, he's was physically moving the finance people. He and Chief Gowns, a couple others were in their shorts and t-shirts and lugging, lugging gear. So doing whatever it takes. Um, and we've got us up. So, so that is good. That will, that is one last move. Hopefully we won't move people again until our final disposition, but that is a, a plus. On City Hall, we had, uh, we had six firms express interest in the, uh, in doing the study for uh, the analysis of what needs to be done and, and the evaluating mitigation versus prevention. Uh, five were at a walkthrough this week, uh, Tuesday morning, doing the walkthrough to prepare for this. Uh, and I'm trying to remember when those proposals are due. 19th, so that's coming right up. So we will be evaluating those and then that be starting the next phase of really planning what we're going to do with the future of City Hall. So that will be uh, good. Um, we have, we, as you know, we've had a hiring freeze. I would say we're, we're now amending it to maybe a hiring cool, or hiring fridge. Uh, <laughs> so we will be moving forward to, uh, to uh, get a person for the Senior Center, probably around the change of, you know, around the end of the, the calendar year. We will probably be, uh, not probably, we will have to hire a person for DPW. They are short two people. They need at least one of them for the winter. Uh, we can't, we, we need to hire at least that one. <laughs> and we did hire uh, the new social worker with police and, and through Barry, which is, uh, you know, it's been a year and a half trying to find someone. So congrats on that. So that we're still trying to, you know, we're still working very hard to keep our expenses down. One of the reasons why a lot of those projects are showing red is because we've just stopped everything for now. But, um, you know, we also have services to run and uh, people are expecting their roads to be plowed and they're expecting certain, if we're gonna, if we're gonna run them, we need to run them effectively. Um, FEMA, we met with FEMA today. Uh, we are, looks like we're about ready to finalize things with them. They will be, uh, doing their FEMA housing project, as we described here in this room a couple weeks ago. There's no, been no changes. I know we had talked about possible changes in location, and but it's actually going to be, as we discussed, uh, they, we are talking with them. They will uh, not 100% final how this is going to work. They are going to do the upsized water line. It may be that they just pay us the money to do that as a lease payment instead of doing it themselves. Uh, but that is going to be accommodated. Um, and otherwise, I think they're really gearing up. They're trying to finalize we, with us and with uh, obviously the interim zoning you passed tonight was a big thing. They've still got some stuff for the state end to take care of, but they're getting ready to move. I think they're down to now either 30 or 32 trailers down hmm. from 36. So that's that. Uh, office. Um, I think that is it, other than to say that, um, you know, this emergency of ours really did take uh, take hold nationally. I was really shocked, you know, last week I was away at the ICMA conference and, and thinking I was going to get away from it all. And literally every single person I saw was like, how's it going with your flood? How's your flood? I was so sorry to hear about your community. And you know, obviously that's a group of people that pay attention to these kind of things, but it was amazing from all, all even all over the world. So pe people clearly, clearly loaded it and they, they all told Kelly they saw her on the weather, weather channel. So, um, but that was, that was a success. So anyway, that's all I have. And uh, Sal, 940, is that what you had for your over under? <laughs> I was going to have ten, but I we, could, we could we could we could stretch for another twenty minutes, Sal, if you really want. You could filibuster. I'm good. I'm good. Okay, nine at nine forty, we adjourn.